Hey guys, thank you so much for joining. We are live with Matthias Hughes, the Fabio of Martial Arts. True Hollywood <laughs> Fabio, legend. Uh, Has anybody ever you. called you that, by the way? Yeah. Uh, first of all, thank you for having me on the show. I'm a big fan of your show. I've been watching it. Uh, one of my favorite shows was literally right the, the last few segments with Michel Kissy because I know him very well and I have some incredible stories about him and myself and Van Damme. Uh, what was your question? Oh, well, actually, no oh, question. Yeah, I, we want to bring something up. Yeah. Because obviously on screen in movies, you've had so many tough, amazing fights, which we'll talk about. But right. there's another fight. There's another fight you're involved with off screen as far as trying to get the full funding for the last kumite absolutely that's a big fight uh it's a wonderful fight i have to tell you you know what i think it's ingenious about that particular project it has been started by a youtuber yeah, by sure. yeah. and uh so it's a fan film for fans with the fans with the youtubers it's like, for real, this is what everybody's always talking about it. I mean, your subject is martial arts, action, 80s, 90s. Uh, so finally, everybody's kind of like scrambling together, you know, you, everybody else in that community. And it's, OK, let's just get involved more than just interviewing or talking about it. And that's kind of interesting because now you are in the driver's seat. The people that talked about it. Mm -hmm. like uh, david and he has like a lot of people attached to it right so i think it's really really a great opportunity for this community to find out what it takes to do a martial art movies what it actually takes you know yeah. uh it's going to be so interesting because i mean we've been doing this for so many years and so many changes have occurred over the years right that it is becoming more and more difficult to do great martial art movies like Bloodsport, mm -hmm. Kickboxer, King of the Kickboxer. You know, there's were quite a lot of good movies. Cyborg, actually, you know, oh, uh, anything that. with Van Damme, I love. I mean, oh, I'm just, definitely. yeah, I'm, a, I'm, I love Van Damme, one of his biggest fans. And I have so many funny stories, you know, because we we both came around the same time. And uh, I didn't know Van Damme back then, you know, when we went to LA, everybody came for a different reason. And Van Damme wasn't famous yet when I arrived, you know? Mm -hmm. So, uh, but we all had the same ulterior motive. We wanted to be actors, but everybody had a different segue to get into it, you know? Yeah. And the struggle, I loved the show with Michelle Cassi because that struggle is so real. And we all have these stories of the years till it happened. It's just insane, right? Yeah. But yeah, so it's so interesting. But now coming back to last committee, there it is. There is an opportunity, you know, for the community to be part of it. A lot of people going to go there. You know, a lot of YouTubers, Oliver Harper, you know, is also involved. Um, it's so good, it's bad. I had an interview with yesterday. He's also coming, Jason. Mm -hmm. Yeah, sure. Um, you should come if you could. You know, the thing is, <laughs> we'll see. It, it, I wish it, in Germany, we'll see. <laughs> I mean, yeah, I, you know, I've seen you fight and I do all, I see all your uh, martial art exercises and videos and all that. That you're amazing. I mean, oh, you're, thank you. That's that's yeah, you're definitely, <laughs> you're definitely in the ballpark for being in the movies. I tell you that, you know. Yeah, oh, appreciate that. Appreciate that. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so, guys, in the description. There's a link for the Kickstarter, Last Kumite. There's only 10 days left. And Great, it yeah. is moving up. I believe it is at over 100,000 now. But oh, it wow. needs to get like 161 because it's all or nothing. So if it doesn't reach that goal in the next 10 days, then then the Kickstarter and the movie doesn't get any of that money. And that would be a real shame. Because this yeah. needs to be as good as it possibly can be. And every dollar helps. So Thank please you. support it, man. I'm rooting for it. And a Thank lot of you. this was your idea. So Sean David told me you yeah. guys had talked and you basically kind of told him, hey, you should help, you know, put this whole thing together. <laughs> One of those yeah, kind of 80s, 90s type it, martial arts movies. It, you know, literally, it could have been a discussion with you. It was kind of like that. You know, we did a general interview and we both 
talked and loved the 80s so much, right? Mm -hmm. uh, we got hung up on it. And uh, I don't know how it occurred. Somehow he, he's like, oh, I wish I could do it or whatever. And I thought, well, any, you know, if you want to do it, you can do it. Didn't think he would actually do it because <laughs> yeah, that's, that's cool. so far-fetched. I mean, I'm telling you, there was no script. There was no story. I just knew from the get-go that Sean is a go-getter because mm -hmm. he's that kind of personality, you know, he's very driven. And then uh, he, he started picking my brain and I'm like, okay, well, if you have a script, if you have a treatment, I know all the people. The yeah. least I can do is give him a call, ask him. Uh, I like the idea. And boom, he went. I mean, in a matter of three weeks, he had a script. First wow. a treatment, wow. then a script. <laughs> I'm like, oh my God, this is unbelievable, you know? Um, and then it wasn't easy. I mean, he told me he aged 10 years, you know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that amount of stress trying to put everything together, uh, that, that would age somebody. <laughs> yeah, I know. But you know what? Screw it. He, uh, he, he gets this amazing movie off the ground and uh, totally. uh, he loves it. I, I've never seen him happier. Um, I think he's fully in it. And there's a lot of, a lot of people that are pulling on that, that same you know, rope, so to speak, and this is going to be done with or without Kickstarter. It's just Kickstarter will make it even better. Every penny yeah. counts. You know? it'll, Every penny it'll counts. definitely help a lot. It'll definitely help a yeah. lot. And yeah. oh, I, I want to thank uh, Charlie here for the uh, the twenty dollar donation to the channel. Oh. Great guest. Hey, Charlie, <laughs> contribute to the thank you, Charlie. Your, uh, you got your wallet out there. <laughs> <laughs> that shows how many how many loyal followers you have. That's very oh, good. Yeah, yeah, definitely. We got a lot of um okay, so a lot of people are asking questions. I kind of really yeah. want to start at the beginning though, because you mentioned yeah. you went to out to LA to pursue acting. Yeah. So, was there like a specific movie or a star where you're that you were yeah. inspired by and say, I want to be kind of like this and do this kind of stuff? Yeah, yeah. As a, I think as I said, Van Damme, myself, every single person that ended up in LA like a gunslinger, you know? We, we all were like ready to go for it. We, we, you had to, have some, had to have a motivation, you know? Oh, yeah. I think uh, with uh, Van Damme, he said it was Hong Kong movies and, you know, he, he idolized uh, the Hong Kong fighters, Bruce Lee and everybody, right? So mm -hmm. for me, it was never martial arts. It, it was a totally different thing. Um, I, I'm a track and field athlete, right? But I did judo and taekwondo, but it wasn't my calling. You know, everybody has a calling uh, because I'm 6'5". So I, I was really good in track and, and uh, you know, I trained six days a week, did competitions all around Europe, blah, blah, blah. Uh, but I had the foundation of martial arts, but that's never occurred to me. I'm going to go to Hollywood, be a martial art fighter. What happened is I owned a fitness center. And I had a crush on a girl. It's, it's really simple. And she came with this uh, magazine, and Dolph Lundgren was on top of the magazine. And oh, she wow. said, man, that's my dream, man. This guy, oh, my God, he's like six seven and gorgeous. And I'm like, oh, shit, i never be like him. And the girl was so infatuated. I knew I had no shot at her, right? Uh, but it bothered me so much. And then Rocky Four came out. I walked to the movies. And I watched it and I thought, oh man, this guy's like a god. Okay, I'm gonna have to go to LA. I'm gonna have to challenge him, <laughs> kind of, <laughs> you know. I'm gonna, like a gunslinger, I, I, I wanna see if he can do it. I'm not as good looking, not as tall, I'm gonna do it. So I went there and as most people that go there, you go to Gold's Gym in Venice, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Because they're all Schwarzenegger, Stallone. I mean, to that day, everybody works out there, right? Mm -hmm. So I knew I had to go there. I got a job picking up weights like anybody else. John Senna. We all did the same. We picked up weights, re-racked them. And the manager said, well, if you uh, want to be in the movies, that they're shooting He-Man, Master of the Universe. Okay. You should just go. Uh, Dolph is having dinner tonight in this restaurant. It's a VIP place, you know. I'll put you on the list. I'll make sure you, you just go to Dolph and say, oh, Dolph, you know, I want to be an actor like you. And just go, this is Hollywood. You can do it. So I go there and I was so nervous. I didn't know what to wear. You know, I was putting boots on, dressed all in leather, 
short sleeve, you know, I thought <laughs> I got to stick out. Yeah, sure. And I was waiting at the entrance and there were so many people. It's just a VIP place. Not anyone can get in there. And suddenly this limo drives up and Dolph gets out, bodyguard, cigar. Man, he was so good looking, just like in the movies, right? Yeah. Larger than life. And my heart was beating. I was so nervous. I thought, oh, my God, there's my chance. I can be in the movies. Uh, naive, actually. <laughs> <laughs> just got off the boat. What do I know, right? Mm -hmm. So I block his way. Um, and I said, hey, Dolph, I'm Matthias. I'm from Germany. I heard you're doing Master of the Universe. Uh, maybe I can be in your movie, you know? And he, <laughs> he looked at me from bottom to top, top to bottom, and uh, said, well, uh, maybe you can be my standing. And then, uh, oh, that's my mother. Okay. Uh, I will have to be. And oh, I yeah, said, yeah, you, you, that's an important call. So I'll just I, yeah, I really apologize. I want to oh, tell you, my you're mom good. is handicapped. Uh, it takes me one minute. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'll go yeah. over some comments here. Uh, Salty okay. asked Penguin $10 super sticker. Thing. It's been live in, in fans. In, uh, and Okay, um, you guys are asking a lot of good questions. Do, uh, it's not the tour of, I'll be right back, guys. Right oh, back. of course. Yeah, thanks. Uh, uh, it's not the tour of yeah, so this was a very important uh, call. Uh, send your prayers, by the way, because his, his mother is in the hospital right now. So hopefully she'll be okay. But I'll go over these comments till till we get him back. I'm back. I'm back. Oh, that was quick. Okay, I didn't even catch yeah, up. Someone is going to bring my mother up. Okay, cool, great. Um, okay, so so Dolph was so, looking you up and down. Yeah, like, right? like really, like uh, with these strong, rocky eyes, Billy uh, Drago eyes, you know. My heart like boom, 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 and then he said, "Maybe you can be my stand-in." But second thought, I don't think you're big enough. <laughs> you were a weight, uh, though, right? You had some muscle at this time already. Yeah, a lot actually. Oh, yeah. Okay, okay, and. Uh, and then he said, but if someone, oh, wait, he said, uh, maybe, you know, this guy, Ralph Miller, he should be my stand-in. If so, at all, he could okay. be my stand-in, right? Okay. So uh, he pushed me aside, more or less, and my I was devastated. You know, I thought, oh, wow, this is so harsh. What did I do wrong, you know? Later, of course, I realized that's not how it goes. <laughs> and, but, you know, that's how these things are. And then you just don't give up. You know, you don't have a car or anything. You, I heard about the audition, you know, and the audition was somewhere in the city. So I get myself there and there is a parking lot full of people, all six, five, black, white, uh, any nationality, right? With better looking than me, taller than me, muscles everywhere. And I'm like, oh my God, Hollywood is just insane. How am I ever going to make it? You know, but I waited in line <laughs> like anybody else finally get there, but I never got the job. Uh, another bodybuilder got the job, an African-American friend of mine, not friend, acquaintance later, you know, he was also a bodybuilder at Goldstream, but he had a mask on. He played the uh, Skeletor. Mm, okay. Yeah. So if I would have gotten it, I would have only had a mask on. <laughs> but, uh, yeah. 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 Wow. Uh, that, that was the beginning. And uh, I just didn't know, you know, you do everything. I've done so many things. Then I went to wrestling school. Because it wasn't about martial arts for me, uh, because I'm not Van Damme, right? I knew that. I'm very yeah. realistic. I'm just capable of doing action. I want to be an action guy. Okay. So I went to wrestling school, and that was very physical, and I liked it. But it wasn't for me, because intellectually, I didn't feel like a wrestler at that mm -hmm. time. You know, I'm from Germany. I'm a bit more reserved. I'm shy. I'm not, I know. Da, da, da. So it wasn't me. And I thought, ah, oh, okay, that's not me. And suddenly, believe it or not, I, I couldn't believe it. I get a phone call from the manager of Gold's Gym, Derek Barton, mm -hmm. who used to be a stuntman. And uh, he took a liking to me and he said, you're not going to believe it. I just got a phone call from a producer out of Hong Kong. They need to replace this guy, Van Damme. I didn't know who Van Damme was, to be honest, sure. back then, right? Uh, it's a Belgian martial art fighter and he just walked off the set more or less, you know, that's mm. their story, the version of their story. Uh, your chance, go up there, audition. And, um, I did, I drove up there, 
And I thought the only way in Hollywood to make it if I stick out, because I realized there's, I'm a diamond dozen, you know, I mean, there's so many good looking martial artists and fighters and us, it's just too many people at that point, bigger, better deal that was in the eighties and nineties. Right. And, um, so I put on leather pants from my mom, uh, from my father, the very leather pants, cowboy boots, a muscle shirt, totally hideous, to be honest. And <laughs> uh, yeah, it looked kind of weird, but this used to be also my acting shot. Okay. Uh, like my eight by 10, I was the first in Hollywood to use something with an upper body free in my leather pants. And that got me a lot of work later because people always use the face. And I thought my face is not good enough. I'm just going to use my body. I'm going to use muscles. And I hung up that picture at Gold's gym to, next to Arnold, Lou Ferrigno, all the other people. And it was always stolen. And I thought, oh, that's a good sign, you know. Long story short, I get there and the producer, the, the female, Maria Cellino, who wrote the script, the moment I walked out of the car, she had written another script, uh, a sci-fi movie with a guy with long blonde hair. And she said, that's the guy, that's the guy, even though it wasn't even the guy for the movie, but she fell for me and she said, that guy's going to be a star one day, whatever. So, and the producer, Roy Horan, one of the producers, he looked at Maria and he said, no way, <laughs> that's not Van Damme, <laughs> you know, that, that, that can't be, he, he doesn't, he's too big and whatnot. So he took me in the backyard in the garden and he said let's fight you know let's throw kicks and stuff so i i know basic taekwondo judo all that and he wasn't happy you know uh, if you didn't do the splits if you weren't van damme you weren't van damme i mean sure. i must admit that yeah. that's a far cry off van damme a uh, german yeah, he, he set the bar really high so <laughs> no, uh, forget it never gonna get there don't want to get there because that's not me right yeah so sure. and that's why i love van damme because i'm a fan from a, from my side point of view, I don't want to be like him because I can't. Nobody can. It's Van Damme. Yeah. Um, and there's Michelle Kissi. There's all these people. Everybody's different. So long story short, uh, the producer said, the female producer, if you don't take him, I'm not going to do the movie. <laughs> and oh, then, uh, okay. so she was a big fan of yours, <laughs> right from the get go. Yeah, she, she ended up being my godmother, and uh, she just look. She discovered uh, John Travolta. So wow. I kind of had a hunch that I should hang with her afterwards, mm. you know. Yeah. John Travolta was at her house. Bruce Lee was there all the time. Believe it or not, she was that well connected, right? Wow. She knew Bruce Lee. I'm, I'm not lying to you. This she, she had a restaurant. Bruce came. Everybody was always hanging out there because she was like an Italian mama. So, mm, okay. uh, and she was adopting uh, young actors, so to speak. And I was one of them. So was John Travolta and Bruce Lee was a regular but not managed by her or anything, you know? Mm. So um, long story short, I fly to Hong Kong, uh, Bangkok, sorry. And I met Lauren Avedon uh, on the plane. I had no idea who he is. He said, well, I don't know. This happened so quick. Kurt McKinney uh, is not doing it. I shot this uh, uh, commercial for Slice or 7up. They saw it. I got booked. Here I am. We're making a movie. <laughs> wow. It was amazing. Right. I didn't even speak English. <laughs> yeah. I had no clue what's going to happen. If it wouldn't be for Maria, who put her head out for me, you know, on a sling, I would have been never cast ever, ever, not a chance. So I get there and I have this, all this dialogue and I'm like, oh my God, I don't even know how to act. I don't know anything. I'm not even, anyway, I'm here. And there was one actor, Max Steyer. So I kind of like befriended him and, you know, uh, show me how to act, blah, blah, blah. And then I'm in Bangkok and I get a phone call. <laughs> this is hilarious. I tell you. Uh, yeah, uh, come on down. We want to do something. And I'm like, oh, so I go down and I see there's a camera set up and another camera. And there's like a thousand people watching because it's Bangkok, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, and the director, Ko Yang, he said, now show me what you got. And I'm like, okay what do you mean show me show you where i go <laughs> well you know do the splits do this do that and i'm like <laughs> <laughs> the the guy flipped out. For a little while he flipped yeah. out he flipped out he started yelling so loud in uh chinese mm -hmm. thank god i didn't know what he was talking about and uh walked off <laughs> i mean i'm fired that's it you know
So they left me behind and um, started filming without me. And I had to uh, go in a training camp in Bangkok. I trained my ass off in movie fighting with the Hong Kong people, okay. right? Yeah. With the stunt guys. And I, I really realized I have a thing for it. You know, I like it. I like to get punished. I like to fall. <laughs> I, you know what I mean? I just don't, I have no fear at that mm -hmm. time. I was 26, yeah. right? Sure. Uh, pain means nothing. And in Hong Kong, if pain means nothing, you have a shot, right? Mm -hmm. you, you have to do this for real. So eventually they're calling me into the jungle and shit hit the fan right away i mean th th they hated me so much because i couldn't deliver my dialogue all mm -hmm. i had to do is in my chair turn around and say something but i couldn't even turn my chair around the right <laughs> way missed my mark the director runs off yelling would have been you know whatever he said it wasn't nice the dp comes to me literally in the same moment and says listen uh, if i can give you an advice once this movie is over your nose your nose is so big you should have a plastic surgery on your nose if you want to make it the business and i'm like oh my god this can't get any worse right <laughs> yeah and, uh, I think you say hey learn how to speak english and read the dialogue instead of fix your nose <laughs> yeah and become van damme while you edit yeah, yeah. Done. Do the splits oh. too while you're at it. <laughs> yeah, and they cut my hair short and slicked it back, so I look a little bit like him, and which never happened. I never looked like him. Long story short, they set up the first fight with their best fighter. He's the biggest and tallest from the Hong Kong people, and we went for it. And I hurt him really bad, unfortunately. You know, okay. we hurt each other, but I um, he got a bit hurt. It wasn't so much my fault, but I realized this is what. Hong Kong is all about. And it clicked in me. And I said to myself, no, no, you don't have to bark. I said to myself, you must be willing to get hurt. And I changed my mind and I said, I'll do anything you want. Huh? Any stunt, anything. I don't care. I'll do it. Drag me, punch me, whatever. I don't care. I'll do it. And I loved it so much. I became like uh, that guy. I was looking for the next beatdown, right? And it wasn't enough for me, actually. I wanted to do more. And Lauren Avedon is such an amazing Taekwondo fighter, right? Yeah. That it was so easy to work with Lauren. I mean, he was just, wow, you know Lauren. You know what he can do. It's, it's kind of what you do. That does, Lauren does that. And it's very easy if you're big to fight someone like that that's very professional. Never hurt each other. It was fantastic. And then Cynthia Rothrock, immediately my favorite person because uh, A, she was tougher than anybody. I mean, she was full contact all the time. At night, she couldn't even hold her toothbrush. She would never say no to anything, ever. Wow. She is the most adventurous, amazing woman I've ever met, right? I looked up to her, and we were both like newcomers in an American movie. Even though it was a Chinese movie, it was a big budget, and it would go theatrical. Yeah. And we knew that. We knew this is our chance, you know? And... Uh, we we formed a really great friendship because uh, I mean I I looked up to Lauren I looked up to Cynthia because they were really crafted martial artists you know mm -hmm. and that's where the journey started um, of me having to adapt to these great fighters. So For sure, M Matthias, we'll yeah. continue that journey in one second. Let me just try to catch up on a a couple. Oh of yeah, 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 here. absolutely. Got, speaking of martial artists, a mutual friend, the Royal Gassan. It's he said, hi, it's Prince Garius. Please send my regards oh, to my dear friend Matthias. He's a wonderful Aikido master. Definitely. And congratulations. He just he just got married. Got married, yes. Congratulations. Yeah. Garius. Congratulations. He's yeah. His, his princess. His princess. The prince that has a beautiful princess. Yes. Exactly. Uh this this comment from Sebjan88. Mission of Justice is my favorite Matthias film. Oh wow. Hey, do you want to hear a nice background story about that one? Sure. Yeah, definitely. Uh, it's just unreal. My favorite scene, and that really drove me crazy because I couldn't do anything, was the gunplet scene with Jeff Winkock. Remember that? I don't know if you saw the movie. Jeff Winkock is an amazing fighter. He did the gunplet. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He's really good with that, for sure. And uh, Kuiji was there. He's an Asian fighter, amazing stunts. And there was this guy, Chad. Stop. I can't even say his last name correctly. Chad. St the, house the, the, the John Wick dude? Yeah. That's okay. his first movie. 
Oh, was that his first one? Interesting. That was his I, first I know movie. He goes way back. Yeah, that's interesting. Yeah, that's his first movie, and he was a stunt fighter, more or less, you know, being the recipient of Jeff Winkler. Mm -hmm. And um, I found that out later, and I thought that's some really amazing trivia because he was basically a stunt fighter that emerged to be the biggest action directors almost of all time, if you think yeah, about it. Crazy. Right? It's pretty awesome crazy. for sure. Through the stunts, uh, then becomes a stunt uh, double for Keanu Reeves, right? So uh, that's Hollywood for you, by the way. Everything is possible and nothing. <laughs> you know yeah, I mean? so it's always important, obviously, to develop those relationships and at work to be somebody that people actually want to work with. Because, again, like you never know right. where someone's going to go. Who would have ever guessed Chad would be like the top action director so i'm sure people he worked with 20 years ago he probably remembers them right and he's like hey right. this guy was really cool uh, i'd like to use him in you know a future film here's right. here's another comment uh thanks for the 999 chris murphy he said uh thanks vs for interviewing these legends matthias was one of the best 90s villains and the epitome of the american dream which i think everybody would agree prayers for oh, your mother you. matthias loved your thank book you. Oh, thank you. Uh, yeah, the book was actually written. Um, I, I moved to Bali, you know, uh, to this tropical island and um, had nothing to do. And I love Hollywood so much. I just sent down, sat down and wrote this book about this journey because it's insane. You know, just like Michelle Kissy uh, told you, we all have that incredible story. So I wrote it in a book shirtless in Hollywood um, because I made Obviously, my career shirtless. <laughs> so, yeah. I wasn't really That's good at I have to say. Arts. There you go. <laughs> yeah, uh, and but oh, I have. Uh, I must tell you something, uh, Michel Cassi, because I just listened to your amazing interview with him. I uh, did Kickboxer Two uh, right after uh, a bigger movie, Dark Angel. I, I'll talk about it later because that's a really nice uh, story there, but. Uh, uh, so when I met Michelle Kissy, I knew who Van Damme was. That was a few years later. Sure. You know, I was I was like in like anybody else, infatuated. I and I was cast to be the bad guy in Kickboxer Two. So sad he wasn't there, but you know who cares? In a way, because you got a job, so you were happy, right? Mm -hmm. But of mm -hmm. course, you wish Van Damme would have been there, but he wasn't. But Tom Paul was there. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, and I was like, oh, this is the. The, the you know the guy from uh, black sport kickboxer right mm -hmm. um and he was so intimidating i tell you he uh was big he was powerful and he he could actually fight like lethal fight right yeah. because we had to go into a training camp uh with benny arquitas and uh he was supposed to whip us in shape and uh Mich uh, myself and Sasha Mitchell, we were the weakest link, to be honest, right? Okay. And um, Sasha uh, and uh, Michelle Kissy was the strongest from us. Um, he was the real deal. I mean, he, he was just... And so I kind of clicked with him, but I was a bit intimidated by him because he felt like a real fighter. So he takes me to this apartment in the valley. And he says, that's that's my apartment where John Claude and I started out. For some reason, he still had it. Yeah. And I was like, oh, my God, I'm in this apartment. And he told me all these stories that he has told you. Mm -hmm. And I was just, I had to sit down on that couch. And I was thinking, oh, my God, we have this, so much struggle we had to go through, you know. And I thought, so good for John Claude. He had uh, Michel Kissy. He's like... Uh, coach or something right i wish i would have had that because oh you man, saw, I, here here yeah. in michelle kesey interviews i well i think everybody wish they had somebody like that in their corner yes just yeah. backing them supporting them helping them just oh man can you what a guy him? you you made I, it without I, your own michelle kesey <laughs> luckily but um yeah. we all had a guy like that that'd be great oh it's like he's i can't wait to see him actually you know because of that interview it, it uh, i was listening to it and i thought oh my god these good old days were the best days because we were struggling so much and it feels so new and exciting you know it's the best time you never forget it but i was uh, in that training camp with benny arkeeters jet center that's the real deal you know 
yeah. Yeah. And then Jean LaBelle shows up. I don't know if you know him. I know of one. Yeah, the, the uh, yeah, that choked out Steven Seagal. And sure thing, man. I'm in that same position, right? So he says, I'll pay you ten thousand dollars <laughs> if you uh beat me on the floor. <laughs> yeah, and he was kind of like really uh setting me up because first he, i did that with a black belt uh i think it was judo guy and it wasn't that difficult for me to kind of like win so to speak mm -hmm. you know because i'm so strong and i felt yeah. oh this is going to be great so I, I i go on the floor with gina who's a, i think it was 70 years old oh, yeah. and i have not a shot in the world not a shot and then uh he has me in the chokehold and I said, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna, this is no way I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna give up. Until today, my jaw is screwed up, right? But it doesn't matter. <laughs> I wasn't about, to, I wasn't about to give up till I gave up. Okay. Uh, sure. Yeah. And then he said, uh, hey, you know, you're lucky I didn't choke your heart. And I'm like, why, why? He said, I like you. Oh, I thought, okay, thank God you like me because you, you could have done anything with me, right? And later I heard about the story with Stephen Sikoff. <laughs> yeah, and, uh, which, which is an interesting story because I I interviewed stuntman Stephen Lambert who was there and also uh, yeah. stunt coordinator Comrade Palmasano. And they said, okay, there was like a little bit of a skirmish, but he never really choked him unconscious. And Sigal never like actually defecated himself, even though people – who they they, they want to believe that if they don't like cigars, right. you know, I, I want to go with that story. People had commented on that video interview, say, "Yeah, I think I'm still going to go with the other story because I don't like cigar." It's like, dude, but the, the truth is more important. I think. <laughs> I know. I mean, he was there, right? Yeah, Conrad and and Steve Lambert. And they That's said, what like, I mean. Did, they were there. You know, I, you know I I think gene labelle is a really nice guy. It would take a lot for him to really hurt you because that's not sportsmanship, like. But the other thing is, how would he ever continue working in film if he literally choked out the lead star? Like, no one would hire him. He'd be blacklisted. He'd be that blacklisted. That makes me question it. And he continued, like the stunt coordinator, Conrad Palmasano, who brought Gene LaBelle on set, continued working with Gene and yeah. Cyril. There's no oh. way they would still work together. So th th there's just too many things that... Wow. You know, you're making a very, very good point. Really choke him out and Steven Skull didn't really defecate himself. They just kind of, you know. Yeah, it's like the trouble. It's like the trouble with Richard Gere, right? Basically. Yeah. Uh, you, you're so right. If you want to hate someone, you're going to go with the story that caters to the haters. Love that if story. You, it's like, if you didn't like the gold, you would love that story. You tell everybody uh, that story and make fun of them. I know. Don't mind. I know. So I don't know. I, I was just happy he didn't choke me out. And yeah, um, that, that could have been the story everybody talking about you then. You know? Right, like, Matthias, pooped, <laughs> Matthias pooped in his pants. Um, I'm lucky that that wasn't the rumor. <laughs> yeah, for sure. Hey, let me ask you this. This is a fun question. So, Muhammad Kisi, Michelle Kisi, he did have like over 30 knockouts in yeah. amateur boxing, so he is very legit. And yes. then, obviously, Don the Dragon Wilson, 11 time world kickboxing champion. I know you fought him in black belt, he's very legit. Here's very a legit. Fun question. Here's a, here's a fun question. An exhibition match against the two, the two of them, you have the world's, what I say, greatest movie kickboxer, Tong Po versus world's greatest sports kickboxer. Who do you think would win? Oh, wow, that is a uh, $1 million question because uh, I know both of them. I fought both of them, not for real. So, but I felt the power of Michel Kissy. Um, but that was 20 years ago, 30 years ago. And I felt the power of uh, Don Wilson. They both have the same power. It's a different type of power. John, uh, Don Wilson, have uh, he moves different than Michel Kissy. It's a different dynamic, but it is as lethal as the one as Michel Kissy, even though it looks very much and feels very much different. Um, there's a certain technique Don Wilson has that, is dangerous. And Michel Cassie is a very power guy. You know what I mean? The, the whole body goes behind oh, yeah. it. Where with Don Wilson, there's not much physical muscle power. It's more, it comes out of nowhere. Uh, he doesn't telegraph. He's not like the kicker. It's not a Van Damme kicker or anything like that, right? So he's, uh, 
Uh, and he has a, a very strong face. So you look at his face, it's the face of a fighter. Benny Arquidas has the same face. The the the, the forehead is so thick. thick. Right? Yeah. Oh my god. So if that would be a real fight, my money. Oh, it's so hard. I wish I would have the answer. I would love to see it. I, you know, the reason I brought it up is because I think we might. Like, I've talked to both guys, and they're both yeah. very interested in the exhibition match. <laughs> so <laughs> I think I we're like going to find out. I think we're actually going to find out. You know, it'll be fun. fun if you could pull this off, it could. It, it, it's a major event. Big I fun. love the idea. And let me tell you something. Okay. These two can afford to do it because they were professional fighters, right? Mm -hmm. Actors like me and others who are not professional fighters don't want to do that because they don't want to lose their image if they lose. Yeah, uh, professional sure. fighters win or lose. They're mm -hmm. still champions. They're yeah. still amazing. If, if you fight someone of that caliber, it is expected either a draw or if you ever were in a fight, you realize you can get knocked out quickly even if you're the champion, mm -hmm. you know, yeah. there's no, no shame to it. So I, I, I think both have an incredible amount of integrity to even think about it. And I love them for that because they're for real. They're the top, top tier people mm -hmm. in my book, you know? Oh, so I, you. oh, for sure. Listen, I was just, this is so interesting. I was just uh, uh, brawling or fighting with uh, Chuck Liddell, you know him? I know of him. Yeah. Great UFC yeah. champ. Sure. Yeah. The real deal, you know, oh, so uh, a champion, he was taller than I thought and bigger. He was uh, outweighing me by 25 pounds, you know, oh, wow. and, um, we are acting, but we're really getting into it. Mm -hmm. And so we're facing each other off inch by inch. And I look at him and I see, oh shit, this is the real deal. This is the eyes of a freaking killer, right? <laughs> like it, like a shark. <laughs> I mean, you let that guy loose. I don't know what's going to happen. So we start skirmish. We 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 didn't have much time to rehearse, and I catch him with an uppercut like this, which I shouldn't have. He didn't flinch, and I'm like, "Oh my god, Chuck, I'm so sorry." He's like, "What?" And I'm like, "Oh my god." <laughs> Any other actor would go home and say, oh, yeah. "I don't want to do it anymore," you know. And then uh, he kind of like only almost tapped me by accident a little bit. And I thought, oh, shit, this can get nasty because he, he does it for a living. And but here's the difference. This guy is such a pro. And that's what acting and real fighting is all about. Right. So he comes to me and he's the real fighter. And he says, but you, Matthias, you do this for a living. So you tell me what to do. Hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. And uh, I'm like, oh, my God, Chuck Liddell is such a humble person. He's a, the real deal. But he asks, he says, I'll follow you because this is what you do for a living. Yeah. But so with other words, if I would call Chuck right now, Chuck, would you mind, can I come in the ring with you for three minutes just to see if I survive? He probably would say it. And then the moment the door closes, I'd be in his world and then maybe never get back out. Yeah, big, big, big trouble. Yeah. It's, yeah. and so this you're working with him in a movie you guys are currently shooting right now in LA, right? Yeah, yeah, Andromeda Wars. It's a sci-fi uh, movie. It's a bit of a skirmish there. It's uh, unfortunately not a three-act fight as I like to do them. Mm -hmm. Meaning, it's a one-act fight. Uh, all fights are like a movie; they have to have three acts. It's the beginning, the middle, and the end. Um, and that's how we used to do Kickboxer or any of. 80s 90s movies every fight tells you a story you know and you need approximately the minimum you need is 12 hours you know yeah, we had like sure. uh, two three hours and i'm like okay so now act two. Oh no 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 we have to go you oh know? you're done that's it okay you got what you got yeah. wow mm -hmm. oh that's the problem with lower budget films you don't have the time you don't unfortunately uh, here's a cool I question Phil Malavik, uh, I've read you've compared yourself to Rutger Hauer. What are your thoughts on him? I love Rutger Hauer. He, he, see, like I said, I was not um, a martial artist. I was wanted to come into this business as an actor without being an actor. <laughs> it's actually kind of crazy, right? <laughs> no speak English, no nothing. He wants to be actor. But um, I had the feeling I could do it. So I went to acting class, all that crap. I was the worst actor. 
horrible. Anyway, um, Ritka Howe was kind of my idol, acting-wise, you know. So I wrote to his agent. He answered. I couldn't believe it. I see him, you know. Mm -hmm. And he said, maybe one day, not now. You not, you know, not there yet, blah, blah, blah. I heard that a lot, you know, there yet. Uh, over the years, you work your way up to it, you know. Like Van Damme starts in a costume, right? My first job was hand doubling Ken Wall for taking Beverly Hills. And I was so proud that I'm in the movies. I took it really seriously. I mean, I was in an actual helicopter on stage inserting the magazine for machine gun. <laughs> But it was only my hands, and I already thought, I'm in Hollywood. You know, that's how delusional you are, but that's how it starts. <laughs> yeah, sure. And then I'm a bodybuilder on the beach with Tom Hanks and Dan Aykroyd and uh, with all the other big bodybuilders. And I thought, oh, now I'm in the movies. You see me. You know, That's how you start. It's really bizarre, you know. Um, but you have to have that uh, beginning in order to make it to the end so that you actually are become an actor or... Uh, at least an action star, a martial arts star, in the 80s, 90s, every single day, a guy walked into Goldstream who was as good as Van Damme. I mean, I'm not saying as good, at least, but they all could do splits mm -hmm. and they could fight and they had a title. And they were French or they were Belgians or they were from Holland or Switzerland and some were so good looking. And I know them all uh, because we we're all friends. I'm talking about Olivier Grenier. Uh, that's the ones that made it. Daniel Bernhardt. Oh, yeah, sure. yeah, that's yeah, the I ones that made it, it, right? Yeah. yeah. And then a countless, countless others that never made it. And uh, we were very competitive. We were all friends, but we were competing against each other. And I wasn't a martial artist like them, but we were still competing with, mm -hmm. you know, because yeah. we kind of, I slipped into the martial art movies as a bad guy. So there I was, couldn't get rid of me. And uh, I kind of learned it and I loved it. And I love it so much that, you know, I'm really into it now. I will never be like you or uh, Scott Atkins, but uh, I'm devoted to martial arts as well, right? Uh, because when you do movies, you learn from the best in a short period of time. Oh, sure. yeah. yeah. You go to camps, like I uh, did a movie Fist Fighter, and I went to a fighting camp with the guy that did Raging Bull. and the rocky the first rocky movie, oh, wow. right? yeah and he he was the, these people are very tough you know like you really learn how to fight and box and they he split my lip the first day mm. um and uh, every single day he split it again you know so you learn to keep up your hands till i was ready and then he, he was calling me girly man i mean <laughs> yeah yeah he had it out of, i mean just that alone is a movie how you get trained to be in the movies to mm -hmm. where they toughen you up. Uh, Benny Akitas, they all do it. They all hurt you a little bit. And this guy was the worst. He, he hurt me in my heart. And at the end, I just went for him. <laughs> <laughs> I'm in front of everybody. I just went for the guy. And um, there was this nasty skirmish. And uh, I kind of, because I know you judo and stuff. Or I don't know if you let me win or what, but, he kind of was on the floor faster than I thought. and um, But that was kind of the graduation. I guess he wanted to get me to become aggressive, to actually go for a real fight. You know what I mean? Yeah, sure. So, and, and he did. Yeah. It's, so, <laughs> interesting it's fantastic. So there's a, there's a meaning to it. Or oh, Benny Arquitas, uh, oh, he, he didn't like me. Uh, I could tell. And... When, you know, the contact hits, we have to take them for the camera, you know. They were always a bit harder than for the others, I felt. But I loved it. I thought, punish me. I want to be like you guys, you know. Give mm -hmm. me something, you know. Yeah. Uh, Sasha Mitchell was not a martial artist, but he became one. You know oh, what I mean? No, he actually became one because of that. That's interesting. Yes. I, I thought yes. maybe he had a kickboxing background, but it's like he just learned it um, Man, as he got the role. He learned it. Interesting. Because... Uh, we were both the weak link and we hated it so much to be the outcast people. And, and we took it both seriously. Mm -hmm. I mean, he, he took it really seriously because he went on to do more of, oh, yeah, the, sure. you know, yeah. So my, 
had my talk to him i love it he's amazing so um if there's a will there's a way yeah um definitely, definitely. Mat matthias let me read this comment real quick and then i do want to ask mm -hmm. you something uh so this is amir god see 20 th bucks thanks so much amir uh, like I mentioned in a comment earlier, if you got your wallet out, I love you. I love your people. Starter campaign for um, the last Kumite. It's very important to meet the goal. Uh, but but Amir says, David, this is great. Matthias, thank you so much for sharing your stories. You're truly a class act and a gentleman. Many blessings to you, both of you, and positive thoughts and prayers for your your mother, Matthias. Oh, so oh, thank you so much. I totally appreciate it. Every word you say means something to me. I, I mean it. You know, we all martial artists and the word means a lot, you know, thank you. And so I wanted to ask, okay, so it sounds like <laughs> you didn't have the best, um, at, well, it sounds like the people in Thailand for No Retreat, No Surrender 2 didn't really think you were the most qualified or suited for the role in the movie, but you obviously kept making movies and you still to this day make movies. So what happened right after that experience? Did you get offered another role or did you just yeah, go back to the Nichols gym or what, what happened? No, no, it's crazy. Well, I, I love this. This is like my favorite thing. It's like I come back and the movie doesn't come out. It, you know, like blood spot. It just, boom. Just on the you shelf. Don't know. There. Right. Okay. Yeah. So I, I I started uh, being a bodyguard, collecting money, working at Chippendales, all kinds of odd jobs, you know, crazy shit, literally, uh, which you need to do in order to become a bigger, better person. You know, you need to. I slept. Uh, I had no place to live. I slept in, 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 in. I met a guy. He was working in a mud wrestling place, and he let me sleep in his um, laundry room with a pit bull on the floor. That was my life, you know, and literally in the laundry room outside the house with the pit bull in the dirty laundry. But I loved it uh, because I wanted to suffer or for some reason I want to earn it, you know, like the dishwasher career. And then I end up uh, being a referee in a mud wrestling place where the girls wrestle in the mud and all the movie stars go. And but I'm the referee and at night and digging the mud back out of the pit and all these pretty girls, they just walk by me like I'm a janitor or something. Mm. Uh, it was just horrible, but uh, I embraced it. And uh, time goes by and believe it or not, the movie comes out in the movie theater. Okay. Uh, in Hollywood Boulevard. And I'm like, oh my God, this comes out of the left field. So I go there. It was sold out. I couldn't believe it. Wow. And um I'm walking in as a nobody and I'm walking out, I'm uh, outside and there were some TV stars there and all that stuff, you know, minor, not minor, but just TV. Back then TV was not so big yeah, like yeah. today. Yeah. Um, and, oh, I saw the movie, congratulations. Uh, uh, uh. And I thought, oh my God, this is crazy. You know, uh, I'm in the movies and I'm telling you the next day the phone rang. Okay. The next day, uh, it was a film called Fist Fighter, the one with the guy from Rocky, right? Yeah. Um, he saw the movie on that weekend, and uh, he tracked me down. And they were about to uh, cast a, a football player who was 6'11", but he, in the audition, hung the producer upside down out of the window, out of the fourth floor, to show how strong he is. And that killed kind of his job. And then... <laughs> <laughs> literally and then yeah, uh, they told me that i'm like what an idiot and they said you got the job you know so that was my 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 next movie and then um that also went theatrical they had oh. a billboard as on uh, new york times square as big as the whole uh yeah you're, so you're getting great exposure pretty quick yeah, yeah. and then um but I had no money. None of these movies pay any money, you know. I was always living on a couch with some girl. And then um, I did a movie with P.B. Herman. Oh, uh, yeah, sure. Yeah. And all these big people are in this movie, you know. Uh, Benicio de Toro, Valeria Golino. That, she was an, a, a beautiful Italian movie star. And I, I was basically, I was living on a couch. I had no car. 
and Chris Christopherson and everybody. Um, next thing you know, the girl is like uh, coming, you know, we're becoming friends and she wants to date me. So she calls Maria, my manager from No Retreat, No Serena Part 2. She's Italian. She's Italian. She says, I'm going to marry Matthias, you know. Mm -hmm. And uh, I was like, oh, but I have a girlfriend. And uh, she was a big movie star. And so she calls me and says, let's go to Steven, uh, Steven Spielberg's house, you know hang out there she was connected yeah and i was very young and i didn't know yet and i i didn't go because i had a girlfriend right mm -hmm. and then she took benisa the toro and then she kind of got the hint and she started dating him okay. and look what you know so he, he she took him in the right circles too right yeah sure that's uh, you should always uh, think about twice. I was dating some nice person, beautiful girl, but she was uh, a waitress at Tropicana, right? Mm -hmm. and, uh, but to end this in a really sad note, but funny now, <laughs> uh, <laughs> someone took a picture of uh, Valeria Golino and me holding hands like this, staring each other's eyes like two lovebirds, blew it up and send it to my girlfriend. And um, I come home from filming, I moved from another couch to her couch at that time, uh, from my friend's house into her house. Mm. We just started dating. Long story short, um, I come home, there's suitcases on the street. <laughs> wow. So basically, um, you might as well have just dated the, the other girl because your, your girlfriend thought you did anyway. <laughs> right. Uh, homeless wow. again. Yeah. Um, but I suddenly get a phone call, the phone call of your lifetime. This is unbelievable. If you think about it, I didn't know what this call was about. It was they needed a track and field agent, uh, the agent, athlete, not an agent. I'm a CIA agent, by the way. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I have funny stories about that too, the CIA. But long story short, um, I get that phone call because I'm an athlete, and I go to the casting office, universe near Universal. And uh, the, the room was full of athletes, like big guys, you know, tall guys, basketball player, uh, track and field guys like me. And they were looking for someone that can do, they can jump over cars and do stunts and like the ultimate guy, yeah. physic, physic, physicality as an athlete, not a fighter. And uh, I finally make it inside. I thought, oh, whew, so many again. And I, um, the director takes one look at me. And that was it. It was love on first sight. That was Greg Bexley. And he said, ah, you know what? I'm going to talk to you alone. There was not even a casting for me. He, he took me in the main room and he said, listen, listen to me and listen to me really careful. This is going to sound really strange, but this is, this is true. You see your day today. I'm like, what is my day today? He said, do you know Dolph Lundgren? And I'm like, do I know Dolph Lundgren? You know, I was like, yeah, I know Dolph Lundgren. And he didn't know how I knew him. And I was like, what is it going to be with Dolph or something? Yeah, you're not going to believe it. Dolph, it's supposed to be the star of this movie. And it's a Terminator alien movie. Mm -hmm. He doesn't want to do it. Can you believe it? He doesn't want to do it. Okay. And I'm like, so where do I come in? You're going to do it. <laughs> and that's your movie, not his movie. Because the movie was written for the alien, not for the cop. He wants to be the cop. Who wants to be a cop? He wants to be the cop. Wow. I think he wants to show that he's also an actor. But uh, in my opinion, he's making a mistake. That's what the director said. But mm -hmm. he's Dolph Lundgren. He can do what he wants. Uh, it's your chance. But but you're going to... You're going to have to do everything I say. I mean, this is going to be crazy what you're going to have to do. Uh, you, if I say jump, you're not going to ask how high do you jump, right? Mm -hmm. You're going to do it. And I said, uh, yeah, I'm used from Hong Kong movies. Uh, one Hong Kong movie, not movies. One Hong Kong movie I've done. So uh, I said, I'll do it. I don't care. And I, I did. And th it, it was crazy. I mean, I, I, I risked my life on a nightly basis. And um, I lived to please this guy. I mean, I lived to please this director. This is all I could think because Dolph was in the movie. And I, uh, I, I was only a small, I mean, I had a small trailer. Dolph had a trailer, like huge. I never saw him. He was like a movie star and I was nothing. So I was always out there with the crew. I loved it. I loved every second of it. 
but I had no working permit. <laughs> it was illegal. <laughs> <laughs> I, I had walked the Mexican borders a few times, you know. And um, it didn't matter. They didn't know. I had fake papers. Anyway, I work. Long story short, um, it was insane. Uh, I mean, it was to the point where I literally thought, am I going to make this? Because each time I was doing something, there's a fight or the, 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 the stunt cut in. I said, that one, he's not going to make it. You know, he's going to blow up his, and he kept always saying the director, he's just going to have to run fast or whatever, you know, because I can't see with these uh, white lenses. You know? Oh, that's funny because this question that Matrix yeah. Colbert asked, he said another question for Mr. Hughes, how hard was it to run and move with those cloudy contact lenses on in Dark Angel? Yeah, you don't see anything. You, you can't see, see anything. <laughs> no, just shadows. It's like a blind leading the blind, right? And I'm not exaggerating. You know, I would never do this again. So, and I have shoes to make me taller than Dolph. Dolph is exactly the same height like me, believe it or not, right? Oh, okay. Yeah, we both like that. I don't know. It's like brothers or something. The <laughs> same. You, you put us head to head, we're the same. So they said, you have to be taller. And they're putting me in these boots, moon boots. Who's going to run in moon boots, right? So, but I rehearse all these scenes in sneakers with my nice eyes, real eyes. No problem. I can run over any car, jump over a car if I need to. Not anymore, but I used to. And um, do all that. And um, then they put the, the eyes inside, put the moon boots. And you've done it, excuse me, you've done it so many times that you kind of, you just go for it. In the film, in the film world, you always have to just go for it because what else you're going to do, right? It's like an athlete, go for it, tunnel vision. So I run, but the downfall was that uh, it's it's up in a parking structure that's really high, and they built a tower outside with the camera on, and uh, it it held three people plus me jumping onto it. But there's actually, I mean, you can fall down there and then you're finished, right? Mm -hmm. So, but and I come with an incredible speed, and then when I jump through the window, I'm going to be on fire. So I. Nobody knew if I'm going to take everybody down into hell with me. <laughs> Neither did I. And it, it, they call action. And um, again, the, the, the stunt guy says, we can't do this. Matthias is going to explode. Blah, blah. No, he knows it. He's going to run. He's just going to have to run faster. He always did that. He's just going to. He's just going to. <laughs> <laughs> so long story short, I survived it. Nobody got hurt. And then you think, okay, that's a one-off because... Um, today I wouldn't do it anymore. That was in the 80s where you still had to do your own stunts, you know. Yeah, no green screen, nothing like that. Um, yeah, yeah. I And you know what? I admired Dolph so much. I mean, he was like an idol to me. Uh, we couldn't bond because he 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 was kind of like segregated. The couple of times I met him was really nice, you know. Um, uh, I, 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 I mean, for me, I got vindicated because, you know, I got that job. You know, that's yeah, kind of because you first went out there, your first experience was, like you mentioned, trying to, you know, get the masters of the universe and meeting up with them and, uh, right. you know, asking them. And then later you got this movie. Be facing out. off, you know, it was for me. Time. I was uh, very, very uh, blessed and loved all for it. Uh, that was just amazing for me, you know. And that's, I'm telling you, uh, A, I got caught on this movie and, um, the, by the INS, so it was a huge scandal. But Columbia Pictures kind of saved the day, or MGM, I forgot who it was. One of the big boys, I got yelled at. Um, because of them, I got a green card, you know. Oh, okay. Yeah, and then uh, while I'm shooting, while I'm shooting, this, this is unreal. Suddenly, there's this uh, Jaguar and a Porsche and two guys get out, right? And I'm just about to do a stunt. And the Greg Bexley comes, stop, 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 stop. And I'm like, no, I'm jumping. No, you know. no, don't. There's two guys that want to see you. And I said, but how is that possible? I'm in the middle of a movie. He said, no, no, those guys, when they come, that's it. Uh, we were in Hollywood at that time, uh, reshoots, right? And... Um, you must see them right now. I said, I'm in a costume, you know, I'm like seven feet tall. Doesn't matter. Go like that. Who cares? So I'm <laughs> cramping into that Porsche in my outfit, you know, and they drive with a white eye. No, the white eyes weren't in, but I, white hair. I look like a freak. <laughs> yeah, sure. <laughs> yeah. And they drive me to the Italian restaurant in downtown 
and when we walked in the the place was like quiet they thought this is an alien invasion you know uh, literally and yeah uh, it, it was great to see that i loved it i used to actually drive around town in between takes in in the picture car looking like this and looking at people <laughs> without the white eyes but it was still scary enough sure. but long story short he sat me down he says i uh listen to me i um i have sylvester stallone I have Arnold Schwarzenegger, I have Jean-Claude Van Damme, I have Bruce Willis, I have Dolph Lundgren, and if you sign with me tonight, I have you. Wow. You are the next big movie star in Hollywood. I'll get you any deal in any studio, $1 million each, three-picture deal, but you have to sign tonight. And um, I was like, wow, this is like in the movies, you know? Yeah. This doesn't, doesn't happen every day. So I signed it, uh, and they saw he said we saw 15 minutes of this film you're going to be the biggest thing trust me i know i have arnold i know i know these things you're going to be bigger than anybody that's his exact words right yeah. i don't know if he tells it to everybody but i believed it and uh i got signed up with a powerful agent who has brad pitt eileen feldman right and wow. then yeah so i go to beverly hills after the movie and then there's this reception and have you seen entourage um, a few episodes, not not all of it. But. Yeah, and so it's kind of like an entourage where you're sitting in this high-powered agencies and then there's this conference room and there's all these agents and they celebrate you and they, fu and they and it's like your future. Yeah. Okay. Now, welcome yeah, sure. to paradise. Welcome to paradise. Uh, life's going to be great from now on. I go to Gold's Gym. First thing, Van Damme comes up. Congratulations, Jake Bloom, that guy. He just showed me your movie in a private screening. Welcome to the big league. Here's what you should do and here's what you shouldn't do. And he tells me all these things. Don't be a pushover. Always control your projects. Make sure you edit yourself. Don't let them always uh, tell you what to do. Have your own opinion. Be strong. And I'm like, okay, okay, John, I, I get it. I understand it. I was like, wow, okay. It was like a lot for me, right? Not sure. Yeah, so obviously the movie doesn't come out for like a year. Mm -hmm. And then in that year, nothing, nothing. I didn't know that they first wait to see the box office if this movie actually does anything. Oh, okay. Yeah, Yeah. so I laid at the pool for one year, train every day, terribly tan. <laughs> and then um, the movie comes out. I get a limo, all my friends. It's a true story drive to the movie theater, big theater in Westwood, one of those nice ones, you know. And there's a line around the building, and I'm like, oh my God, this is so great to be a movie star. This is so cool, I'm going to see myself on screen and everything. So we finally get to the cash register, and all well, my friends with me, and I said, uh, tickets, one, two, three, four, five, do you still do you still have like eight tickets left? She looks at me, what movie? I said, uh, I come in peace. She said, yeah, plenty. <laughs> Oh, okay, plenty. That, that's not good. <laughs> no, that wasn't good. Uh, so I'm like, oh, that's not good. Anyway, we go inside, and then I forgot. I think it was Die Hard 2. It was a major movie that was running. Like some, that other movie obliviated us, obliviated us. The, the line was for the other. As far as I remember, it was Die Hard 2. Wow. Don't, don't quote me on it. One of those major event movies, right? Sure. Uh, killed us, killed us. We only made. $3.7 million over the weekend. That's nothing. My career was over. Wow. I mean, that over. Sucks, man, that's got, crazy. Like, there's so many variables. Like, you had everything. Yeah. They wanted you. They believed you. Hey, welcome to the big club. Your movie comes out. Everybody's watching the other big movie. And then it's like, that's it. You're done. It's like, Fire. what about Dolph? Maybe Dolph should be done. <laughs> he was done, too. This was, oh, geez, man. That was his last theatrical movie, yeah yeah for a while right so he he kind of like boom gone nobody wanted him because he was the star he yeah. was the mckee star and i was the guy that was supposed to break out so we we just both like flatlined on this one so he wow. had no more movie in the theater no there was he didn't even have the punisher was before so there was nothing and um what happened is i got picked up i was lucky i couldn't believe it i get a phone call Right after, someone picked me up anyway. It was the producer from Terminator, right? Terminator. Yeah, yeah. Platoon, all this Hemdale productions. Uh, we want you. A ridiculous amount of money for me. 
at that time. And uh, I go in, I meet with the director. You are playing a fallen angel. I thought, oh, Dark Angel again. Yeah. Look. <laughs> I literally, I said, my long hair, oh, this is good because I'm not cutting my hair, right? I lost Mammoth Face, a couple of other movies because they asked me, other Pune asked me to cut my hair for Mammoth, Nemesis. And I said, no. So he said, they, they kicked me out of the office. Mm -hmm. You know, they were so angry. But I knew I had to keep it like this in order to be different, right? Yeah, sure. So anyway, I go there, have a meeting with the director, all good, sign the contract. They sent me to a makeup store, makeup, uh, special makeup store. And the same thing like Van Damme, you know, you get that mask with a straw, the whole body. And I'm like, no, nah, I'm used to it. I probably get blown up. No big deal. You know, still gullible. They call me back a couple of weeks later and he's holding a mask. And I'm like, that's a mask. He said, you're going to put that on. I said, but why? <laughs> well, because I thought I'm an angel, fallen angel. No, well, yeah, but you you play the fucking devil, right? I'm like, the devil? That, uh, no, I, I am an angel, a fallen angel. No, no, you're playing the devil. Put this thing on if you want it on. So I put it on and I'm, I'm looking in the mirror like, that's Freddy from, that's Freddy Krueger. I look just like him. Oh, well, you signed the contract, you're going to do it. Mm. and uh, they talked about Billy Idol, Tina Turner, it was a bigger budget movie at that time don't be stupid, do that movie and then they hit a wrong nerve with me and I said no I'm not, they said no you are I said I'm not, well nobody says no to us, we're the most you know, we can destroy you I'm like okay, I'm not doing it uh, because of it so, so I go home and then uh, they call Maria, Italian She's like also mobster related and everything. So they live in another world. And the guy that called her was like threatening to break her leg or something if I don't sign it, right? Mm -hmm. And I think uh, they were joking. And I still don't know to that day if that's true or not, but that's wow. what she told me, right? Uh, she had to talk me into it or else. I'm like, that's really, now I'm definitely not going to do it. No fuck, no way, sorry. Yeah, yeah. I get that phone call. And I thought I'm in the movies. You know, it's like you get a phone call from Sopranos with mm -hmm. that dialect, with that power in their voice. It says, you don't know who you're fucking with. This is the most powerful company in Hollywood. You will never, ever, ever work in Hollywood again. Not only that you will never, ever work in Hollywood again, we'll haunt you out of this town and you never come back. So think twice about what you're going to say now. And I said, no, I'm not doing it. Boom. <laughs> Yeah. And next thing you know, I get detained by the INS. Really? <laughs> yeah. They they really went for it. And um and I told my manager at that time, I'm gonna run. I'm gonna run. I'm coming back through Mexico. There's no way you can stop me, you know. But uh we could actually I still had a few days left on my green card, so they couldn't do anything and then I quickly uh renewed it. Okay. So, <laughs> they thought I had no green card, you know, because the word got out at one point. Uh, so I got lucky. But they were making my life miserable. And then, you know, luck has it. The company went out of business. Oh, really? <laughs> the biggest company in Hollywood, because the man, you know, the, the owner kind of had some financial discourse and he died and blah, blah, blah. And uh, he went out of business. And then later on, he died. So with that died, the threat of me never working again. He died with him. There it goes. That's, that worked out mm -hmm. for you. <laughs> yeah, I'm not saying I'm happy he died. I'm just saying he would have died anyway, not because yeah, of me. Yeah, sure, sure. And, uh, yeah. and years later, I meet this guy in Brentwood, really nice guy. And he's like, oh, my uncle is John Daly, my mentor. And I'm like, oh, my God, that's the guy. <laughs> and now I'm sitting in his living room and I have to pretend, oh, yeah, he's a nice guy. <laughs> <laughs> That's funny. Wow, that's crazy. Um, hey, here, here's a question from uh, Sun God, and thank you for the $5, Sun God. Do you feel the martial art action movie era ended too early for your career? Yeah, I see, I have a bit of a bone to pick. Um, no, it's not a bone to pick. It's like this. It's very easy to explain. Um, the whole genre died. Yeah. Right? So the guy that uh, signed me up for the big deal, Jake Bloom is his name, right? 
he called me in his office because I kept calling him. I said, come on, this can't be over. This can't be over. And he finally called me in and he said, listen, I had the same talk with Arnold. The time of the muscle and the action is over. It is over, Matthias. I told to Arnold the same thing. Arnold actually fired him right after that uh, talk. <laughs> yeah, I can yeah. see that. You don't want to yeah. hear that, man. <laughs> yeah. And, but the truth was, if you really think about it, Steven Seagal, Jean-Claude Van Damme, Dolph Lundring, Don Wilson, Sita Rothrock, every single person in that martial art business starting in the year 2000 mm -hmm. disappeared. Mm -hmm. Disappeared into Bulgaria, uh, Romania. You know what I mean? Yeah. And uh, the, uh, including Dolph, Seagal, myself, was unemployed because they were bigger names, so they were still working, right? They mm -hmm. still were good for some money. What you need to understand is like this. I want everybody in your community to understand it because it gives me an opportunity to explain to you why the film world from the 80s and 90s changed so much. It's like the housing crash in 2008. So uh, in, in 1990s up to 2000, if you have a poster and you have uh, two names on it, JCVD, Michelle KC or myself and then uh, Michael Worth or anything, right? Mm -hmm. You go to the film market and they would actually give you $500,000 in cash. I mean, mm -hmm. not in cash in a suitcase, but yeah, sure. <laughs> down the road. <laughs> uh, just for Germany mm -hmm. or for England, 250, 350. It was immense. So yeah. it adds up to millions, right? On a poster. Yeah. So um, that being said, we had millions to shoot this movie. Kickboxers was millions. Bloodsport was in the millions. Uh, Double Impact in the tenth of million. I mean, that was a lot of money, yeah, right? Yeah. So these movies had 35 millimeter. There was a training camp. There was time to for a three act fighting scene, right? Mm -hmm. There was time and love and great music and everything was there. And then in 2000, it died. Nobody wanted to do it anymore, and the film market no poster was worth a hundred thousand suddenly germany was down to sixty thousand right yeah Ru uh, uh, boom 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 so you could only shoot a movie for seven hundred thousand dollars in the beginning and 250 would go right away to the star right so you have maybe 500 and then the producer and this and that by the time you shot the movie it was three hundred thousand dollars right Compared to three million or ten million, yeah, big difference. <laughs> yeah, and that killed our genre. So suddenly, people, if you remember, Van Damme was almost—he uh, had a crisis. Stallone had a bigger crisis, and Arnold became governor. Um, <laughs> yeah, That's yeah. I remember how Sylvester Stallone opened up a protein company and went to the uh, fitness expos in Germany. You know. It was, everyone was so desperate and uh, I was basically literally unemployed to a point, little movie here, little movie there. It's like, oh, what are we going to do? Right. Mm -hmm. um, meanwhile, you get phone calls. I got phone calls to be the bad guy in James Bond and with, with Mel Gibson. I was really still thought after uh, in the A-list category, but I had a bit of bad luck too. Like for instance, with James Bond, um, they tracked me down to be the bad guy. It's a big thing, right? You would have and, been a great Bond villain. <laughs> so uh, I, I, that, that would have really put me back in the A-League. And then uh, the casting director called me and said the director, jo Roger Spotswood, is going to fly in from London just to see you. Okay. And I'm like, oh, that's good. <laughs> yeah. um, good news. So I go into the casting office and there's this chair in this empty room and there's the lights at me and I thought, wow, this is like, feels like an interrogation, like a police place or something, <laughs> you know? And then uh, door opens and then Roger Spatz would, hard to say his name, he walks in and he's taller than me. I can't believe it. He's like six seven. he's like a monster. And I'm so used to tower over people, oh, yeah. right? And I was... Uh, never a good student so i was always afraid of teachers so he had this teacher attitude like you know like this and he intimidated me and i lost my i come in peace 
the dark eye of, you know, I lost yeah, it. Sure. And he, he saw me as a weaker link and I didn't get the role. Oh. Uh, if he would have been, if I would have been, uh, if it would have been Ron Howard, who I read with Ron Howard, I went to his office, Mel Gibson, everyone is there. Uh, it's just a, a small man behind the desk. And I was, you know, I was, you know, I was you feeling good about it. Right? Yeah. Not that size matters, but uh, for that role, it matters. Mm, yeah. <laughs> so, um, Anyway, so many situations. Uh, Scorpion King, I, I was cast to be in Scorpion King. I was cast to be the guy uh, with Jim Carrey also. Um, this happened all in these years. So where everyone was disappearing, I still got these chances. Yeah. Uh, and I booked uh, the movie The Mask, right? And Chuck Russell, who directed all Arnold's movies, he casted me after five times. And the last time I'm there, he says... Uh, uh, you know this girl that just went out? She's going to be a star. Did you see her on your way out? And I said, no. What's her name? Cameron Diaz. You know, I just casted her. Anyway, he casts me. Uh, and then he calls me at home a couple of days later. and says, oh, I'm so sorry, Matthias. Uh, the studio is changing you out against an Italian bad guy. You know? It's got to be um, so frustrating because um, in a way, it's almost like winning the lottery, just getting cast yeah. in a big movie like that. So it's like, it's like, hey, I won the lottery, and then all of a sudden, yeah. like, hey, the ticket's gone. Oh, it's the wrong number. <laughs> it's the wrong number. Oh, but listen to this. It gets really worse. The guy calls me years later. Um, he feels so guilty, and he's we uh, love each other because we love acting, you know. But now I love acting, and I go in, I do all this, and all. And he's like, oh, more, more, do this. Throw yourself on the floor, and I'm doing it. <laughs> and then it's like he cast me in Scorpion <laughs> you know, with the rock. And I'm like, okay, that, that feels good. And um, he introduces me to everybody at Universal Studios and that's your outfit and this and this Matthias and this Matthias, how are you doing? How are you doing? And then, um, unbelievable. I drive home in my car on the freeway. The phone rings. I pick it up. It says, ah, it's Chuck again. I'm like, that can't be good. He's like, yeah, I'm so sorry. I don't even know how to tell you. I just got a call from Stacy Schneider She's the president of Universal Studios. You know, I mean, there's nothing I can do. I said, what do you mean? He's like, it's so embarrassing to tell you I have to exchange you for Ralph Muller. Wow. <laughs> I got a call from Arnold through Stacy, blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, okay, <laughs> couldn't believe it. I couldn't get arrested at that time, right? So, and there was still the Gladiator. I thought that's my last chance to jump on board at least back into the A-League, right? The Gladiator movie. And they were needing one more, one more guy. Couldn't believe it. So I went and got special makeup done for a lot of money because they needed a really rough guy, tumbled, you know. And I got this. And Lou Ferrigno was in the talks for it. And um, uh, some other guy who got it. Anyway, long story short, I didn't get it. So... And then I never forget, I, I'm down and out by then. By then I'm down and out. I'm so pissed. And uh, I'm watching the Oscars and then Ralph is there. Nothing against Ralph Miller, but, you know, he he, he, he was holding the Oscar. And then uh, Russell Crowe says, thank you to Stacy Schneider and Ralph Miller. And I'm like, oh, <laughs> I could have been in this movie, but I wasn't. And um, there's so many of these stories. I had a TV series that I beat uh, Dean Cain out of and... Uh, uh, Lou Ferrigno and some others, and then it didn't get picked up. And there were so many things, right? I was cast to be Hercules, too, by the way. Oh, really? Okay, that makes sense. Yeah, it was... Uh, but this is how it goes. This is really, really crazy. It's... Uh, they cast three people, and all three signed the contract. I mean, and it says, uh, first one, 50,000, 150,000, blah, blah, blah. Whatever money they offer you, right? Mm -hmm. And But then they have three people that they already signed, and only one gets it. Wow! But you don't know that. You go home, you think you got it, and then you get a phone call. Said, "No, well, you know, in the end, we did, went with Kevin's own." Yeah. So it's like that. They have a literally a board on the um, on the wall, and then there's a lot of people that make that decision, mm -hmm. and they either go with the really good looking guy, the tough guy look, or the real bodybuilder. You know, like Lou Ferrigno. Yeah. And then it depends how many women point to what or whatnot, right? Yeah, man, there's so yeah. 
Like I said, it's that's like a one in a million shot to get any of those. I mean, obviously you, you've done a lot of work, but so many of the close calls for the bigger movies like James Bond and, and all that, that's crazy. Here, here's a uh, question from Perry fan 49. Will you ever do a convention on the East coast? Yeah. Um, if there is one, you know, they do have, I don't know if you know who Alan Goldberg is, but he has his martial yeah. arts action weekend. I believe at the end of January every year, you know, obviously there's a lot of martial oh, arts okay. there like uh, Don Wilson, Cynthia Rothrock, Michael Jai White. So you oh, be wow. perfect for that event. Then people can yeah, meet this, like, like this Perry fan guy and get your autograph. <laughs> absolutely. I've done a few, to be honest. I did a con in Germany with Richard Norton, Cynthia Rothrock, Don Wilson. Hey, uh, the perfect weapon. Remember him? Um, yeah, Jeff Speakman. Jeff Speakman. I love this guy. I was yeah, so happy right. to meet him. Yeah. So I got to meet a lot of people myself, you know, mm -hmm. on these conventions. Yeah, for sure. Hey, let me ask you this. Mm -hmm. so was there any talk? Because you've obviously worked with a lot of people, fought a lot of people on screen. Was there any talk of ever working with like Van Damme or Steven Seagal? No. I no. mean, I, I had the same manager that worked but was very close. It was a producer friend, a producer with Bill Goldfine, um, who did all the Steven Seagal movies, right? Mm -hmm. And I kept saying, um, hello, <laughs> let's just do something. And they said, no, it's not going to work with this. It's not going to happen. And I said, that's stupid because, um, listen, if I if I could just work with them, we'll go to the gym together, we get each other in shape, and just stop right there. <laughs> it's not going to happen. It's not gonna happen. Uh, forget it. Never going to do it. And mm -hmm. I thought, okay, well, never going to happen. Never going to happen. And it never happened. I met Steven Seagal eventually in Moscow, in the Ritz-Carlton. He was very nice. Um, but no, I, I, it was funny because he was supposed to be celebrity guest in Rostov, but he asked for too much money and then they took me. <laughs> mm. Yeah, yeah. I think you would have been a better villain against Van Damme than Seagal because Van Damme always fights the bigger guys, you know. And yeah, I would love to work with Van Damme. I mean, uh, look, one of my favorite movies is Universal Soldiers. Mm -hmm. um, I, I love Van Damme. When I see him, I'm going to hug him because he's just an awesome dude. I mean, I feel kinship to him. We're the same age. We suffered the most in the beginning. I mean, obviously, he's way more famous than me, but uh, I, I live that life. You know, I live in Asia. He lives in Asia. Um, it is literally, you know, he's one of us. I mean, he's he, he's on top, but he's one of us, you know. He's a good guy. Uh, so we'll see. It's never too late. Who knows? I want to do a movie. Uh, I have one movie in the platform I really want to do called The Widower. And I actually, after listening to your podcast, I want to do something with Michel Cassie and his brother. Well, yeah, outside of the last Kumite, right? Because you guys are all in that outside one. of the last Kumite. I have one project. I'm going to run it by him. I want to do it. It's a, uh, it's a martial art action movie, um, but it's more like the professional. It's a bit of it's a very good story in it as well, you know. Yeah, I love so, that movie. <laughs> yeah, it, it's kind of like that because it's a guy that is a former athlete. Hello. And um, he's now a businessman, and he's in London, of France, but I wrote it for London. And he has a daughter that is sick, so he makes a quick turn into the wrong part of town. Mm -hmm. And his wife, uh, as he's on the phone with his daughter, what do you need? Benadryl, all that. Diet Coke, Coke, blah, blah, blah. She goes in the store, and there's uh, something going on in that store. They're extorting money, the local gang, in they end up killing her, right? Because it comes to a skirmish with the store owner. They're killing her. I'm trying to save her. And they beat the life out of the character, my character, called the widow, right? Mm -hmm. They beat him to death nearly. And um, so when he wakes up, he's almost a cripple. And he's like, has nothing left to live for. His daughter is back abroad in school. So he moves above that 7-Eleven, that place. Right, it's in the shittiest part of uh, England, Birmingham or somewhere. We're only the yardies. These are the Jamaican, but I want to change it to to French and 
Michel Cassie and stuff, right? Mm -hmm. So where all these drug dealers do horrible things, prostitution, mm -hmm. gun wrangling, gun uh, trading and all this. Um, so he, 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 there's this girl next door who is a street girl. Uh, she is a drug addict. She works the street as a prostitute, but she's like a, like a wild girl who knows the street and she befriends him because she needs to have her puppy being uh, looked after for a couple of days because she's on the run. She owes some money for drug dealing, blah, blah, blah. So they end up being friends. And then eventually she finds out why this posh guy is in this neighborhood, obviously, but even though he's broken, you know, he's not from there. And he says, I want to revenge the death of my wife. And this guy did it. And she's like, oh, God, that's the leader of the guard. He says, no way. He also raped me, made me pregnant, had my child being put to foster home and had my dad, who is, was a bare knuckle fighter, put to jail for life. Mm -hmm. So I hate him as well. But there's no freaking way you're ever going to be a civilian. Yeah. So then he says, well, then teach me the ways of the street. So mm -hmm. she starts opening up that old dojo where her dad is now totally run down. There's nobody there anymore. And she was a town boy. So, you know, she knows all the fighting and she's a street girl. So she teaches him just at least the basics. Yeah. And then she said, you have to learn to be one of them in order to even take on the, the big guy. And she always gets him into trouble in bars and this and then he has to really fight like mm -hmm. dirty fighting and he kind of gets the hang of it and they both really get good at it and they decide there's this compound where they all live they're going to go in and he's going to kill everybody uh but once they are ready to do it they realize it's stupid you know because he, he has father feelings for her now and he doesn't want her to get killed mm -hmm. but they get wind of it and they kidnap her so he has to go in that compound and he has to eliminate these people and the top bad guys on the top floor and in between a prostitution drug the whole yeah. nasty people and he's fighting his way with a ham you know he's fighting his way all the way up and um to revenge to actually free the girl but you know she gets killed but uh in the end he adopts the daughter of her and all that but long story short so it's like a professional in reverse you know yeah it sounds good so is this something you wrote yourself yeah, I write screenplays since a long time because I love the business. Oh yeah, I'm in sure. the business. So yeah, and um, so that's the one I'm gonna try to put together. And I, I, I'm watching your show, I'm listening. I'm listening to Michelle Cassie, and I think, screw the Yardies, the Jamaicans. I'm gonna make it uh, probably in France and have him and his brother be the main gang people and have, fight him you know sure. he's so he's so convincing he's so mm -hmm. strong uh so I'll, i'm gonna present it to him yeah mm -hmm. oh nice that's awesome that's great and yeah so since you're a writer yourself did you give sean any feedback on the last kumite script yeah but there wasn't much the first draft already i liked it it's pretty solid yeah yeah and he's got a good director Oh yeah, right. sure, sure. That guy's yeah. been in the industry for like twenty years. Um, yeah, so I I think they should just do, and um, I think they're going to do great. Again, you don't have millions, so you have to look. Blood sport was blood, sweat, and tears. I know. Um, I I saw your show with uh, Sheldon Lettish. You know. Yeah, sure. I know Sheldon very well. He's an amazing guy, and I love listening to him. <laughs> And uh, he he reiterated it again and made everybody aware of it that this wasn't a hit to begin with. This was a piece of love, work, and compassion, right? Mm -hmm. And it because of that and Van Damme and him re-editing it, it became this. Yeah. So this movie, The Last Committee, needs that also. Yeah, yeah, a real passion project. It sounds like yeah. about that. Here's here's a question. Um, are you going to be in Black Creek? That's that Western movie Cynthia oh. Rock, Rock is involved in. No, no, no. Oh, because it seems like everybody's in that movie. Like every yeah. week I see a new person. Oh, we got Benny the Jet. We got Billy Blanks. We got, yeah. uh, you know, Lauren Avenon, you know, so. I hope they do have Lauren. Um, no, I, it just didn't happen. I don't know why. Um, I, yeah, don't have to be in it. I think it's great they're all in it, you know. I, to be honest, look, they're all fantastic martial artists and they should be amongst each other. You know, um, I'm no black belt. Uh, 
I know how to fight. You know, I, I know how to do these things. And they're all in their own group. So I, I get it, you know. I, I understand. I am I'm a different character. I, I brawl differently, you know. Um so maybe they feel like I don't fit in it or something. I don't know. You're uh, a movie martial artist fighter. And, you know, if, if you didn't say you weren't a black belt, people wouldn't even know. They'd just probably assume you were. A lot yeah, of you know what? I had that taken out of IMDb. Some jokes that put in, uh, I'm a black belt in Taekwondo. And I saw that and it bothered me so much. I wrote to IMDb. I said, you can't have that in there. That's not me. I don't want to lie. I, I'm someone that learned it in Hollywood doing it with the best people you can even dream of working with, right? That's all, you know. And I, I practice now myself a lot, um, but I'm not Olivier Grenier, you know. Mm -hmm. um, they really good. You are an amazing technician as well, so you're right I there. You should, oh, you. totally. I can't do what you do. Uh, you should be in this movie also, Black Greek. Um, so m maybe there's not enough room for everybody. Let's put it that way, right? Yeah, no you take feelings. up a lot of screen. You're so big. Uh, speaking of which, did you ever think about competing as a bodybuilder? No, because I, I, I've never seen myself as a bodybuilder. I, I just don't. Um, Ralph Miller was a bodybuilder, and rightfully so, right? Arnold, I, I've never wanted to be what I don't feel like being. I only wanted to be a big guy in the movies that uh, can move, you know, like Liam Neeson, you know, uh, I know all the big guys in the stunt industry and look at Liam Neeson. Why is Liam Neeson? I know he's not a martial artist. He, he probably won't be on your show, but uh, he did a good job in Taken, right? Because that was a great movie yeah. and it had a great story. And, I know who trained him. I had a meeting with him, uh, Olivier Schneider in Paris. He uh, does all the Taken movies. He's done all the Fast and Furious movies. He's doing all the James Bond movies. This guy's it, right? He's the mm -hmm. top action director in the world, like fighting. Sure. And he explained exactly to me um, how they do it. And look at John Wick, how Keanu Reeves became John Wick. That's because you can do it with the right people, the right amount of money, someone like Olivia Schneider or Chad, Daniel Bernhardt, they're all very helpful in that. They can create someone into an action star. And I'm more that kind of guy. I'm, uh, I'm not saying I'm a big star, but I'm saying I have that kind of quality. You know, I can listen, learn and do it. I can execute it. Like this movie, I, just explain to you. So if I do this movie, The Widow, right, mm -hmm. you will see a lot of real muscles, someone that really knows how to swing. And I'm going to combine a lot of kicks and like really hardcore things. And I will have this hammer you use in the gym. I used it there in the movie to train, right, get my muscles back. So I'm going to use that in a lot of shots. So it's going to be really a different, it's not going to be a martial art movie, but it's going to be a brutal you know, raid type of yeah, film, thinking, right? Yeah, for sure. Yeah. So that's more me. Um, you won't see me doing a Scott Atkins Undisputed. That should be Mark Zoror, mm -hmm. who yeah. has its rightful place in that, who did excellent in John Wick. In John Wick 4, yeah, he, he was great in there. He was great in there. Mm -hmm. uh, let's let's yeah. go over some more comments. Uh, Carnivorous Barbie, thank you for the $5 super sticker. And let's see what else we got. Uh, Deathmatch was a pretty good film back in the day. Yeah, low budget, but uh, that was fun. Wasn't Benny the Jet in that one too? I think. Yep. Yeah. 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 Oh, he was always he was always there. I mean, Benny the Jet is an institution. He he was coordinating, and he was in almost all the movies. He did a movie with John Cusack as well. Uh, he's amazing. Yeah, for sure, for sure. A uh, comment from Carnivorous Barbie. What a struggle these guys go through. Great guest. I would have loved to see Matthias against Van Dam. Maybe it can still happen. Hopefully. I hope so. I, I, I love the guy. We'll see. But so have you actually met him or have you not met him? In person? No, I do. I do. I know. You, you know him? 
Oh, yeah. Oh, okay, so would you say you guys are friends or what? No, acquaintances. I mean, when he sees me, he, he's like Matthias and then Van Damme. Oh, okay, so he, okay, that's cool. Nobody, look, uh, we never ever on one place at one time at the same time. It's like mm -hmm. uh, he lives in Asia. I, I live in Bali most of the time, in LA, Vegas. Uh, Dolph is in, uh, he's always gone. You know, I mean, uh, it, it's for some reason we never see each other. Uh, I saw him a few times. Oh, I did see him. Uh, he was producing a film, something with a train. It was a movie. Oh, are you talking in. about Derailed? Derailed. That's I a horrible him. movie, by the way. Was it? Really? I've, made, oh. I've, I've commented on that movie a couple times on the channel, you know. Um, oh, I didn't, I didn't see it. I, I was yeah, there when he was... <laughs> Oh, he was casting it, and he's like, oh, Matthias, blah, 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 to the director, you must hire Matthias, you know. But nothing happened. Oh, another thing, was this happens all the time. I'm in a nightclub, uh, Bar One, that was the biggest nightclub in, in L.A. Uh, I used to get paid just to be in nightclubs for some reason with my okay. short leather, with my leather pants, right, okay, sure. and my muscle shirt. I became like an institution in the early years. They were only hiring me to be there. Uh, I, I didn't have to do anything. Um, so later on, I still used to go there after my movies. And then there's Wesley Snipes. And um, Wesley Snipes, he comes, he sees me, and he, he goes like this through the dance floor. All these people come straight at me, and I'm like, oh, my God, did I, did I do something, you know? Uh, what and then he goes like you know uh, uh, I'm Wesley Snipes I like you I like your movies I want to work with you one day you know and I'm like oh wow that's Wesley Snipes thank you you know oh, he's gone <laughs> yeah. he's gone so I call my manager right away guess what uh, so he calls but I wasn't in Blade either you just don't know yeah you would have been amazing in Blade I was thinking about Blade once you brought up Wesley Snipes. Here's yes. a, uh, a question. Black Belt Mindset. Thanks for the $5. Appreciate you, VS and Matthias. How was it working with Billy Blanks? Fantastic. Yeah. That guy, A, he had real muscles. Like, I was not, uh, there weren't that many martial artists with muscles, right? Other than Van Damme, real muscles, like, the, you know, the striation and oh, everything. Yeah, sure. It really had muscles. He had muscles. So I liked that. I was really happy to see and i thought this is going to be great we're going to take our shirts off six packs ah oh, finally i have someone that is like wow his muscles are bigger than mine even i loved it i loved every minute of it and um he was so kind and nice and he was a professional fighter and at no point we were like even in a competition we were just friends trying to do the best and some of it was a bit dangerous um not yeah well in the end with the uh, when he hits uh, i hit the no he hits with the pipe through the car that was for real you know and i thought this this can go really wrong but i did it anyway nothing happened but i loved him i just loved him he was such a great uh fighter and genuine and he went on to do Tybo, Tybo, Tybo. Oh, yeah, that's huge. And he's still doing that today. Yeah. Like, I think he's kind of uh, rebooting it, so to speak. Uh, I've seen he it in should. His he, Instagram video. Yeah. He, he blew up so much. We were like, well, where's that from? Coming from? He's, he was a multimillionaire suddenly, right? Anybody, everybody in the world was doing Tybo. Mm -hmm. So I was really proud of him. And um, so... I think in last committee we're gonna fight each other. Yeah, the reunion. Sure, that's gonna be cool. Uh, another question from Perry Fan Forty Nine: How was your experience working with Lorenzo Lamas? Oh, I forgot Lorenzo. Hey, the nicest guy on the planet. The nicest guy. I mean, there's a lot of nicest guys, so he's one of them. He's calm. He's mellow. He's he's a really good martial artist, and. Has really thick hair. <laughs> yeah, he, he's got amazing hair. You got amazing hair too. Um, no, no. I mean, he. That, I couldn't believe it when I uh, saw him. I was like, oh, 
damn, he's so good looking. And then, <laughs> no, you know, I'm in a manly way. You know oh, what I yeah, mean? Yeah, you could, look, yeah. I get it, man. You can appreciate, like, people feel that way about Van Damme, for example. You know, yeah. Scott Atkins yeah. said that about Van Damme and Bloods, where he's such a beautiful man. It's like, yeah, yeah exactly. he is. You know? yeah. I mean, credit deserves, so credit is deserving. And um, he, uh, he was so nice. And, um, well, I have nothing but good things to say. And then he did Renegade. Yeah, that was a huge show. And mm. you know what's interesting? So I asked Jeff Langton a question yeah. because he worked with a lot of great martial artists like you did. As I love well. that interview, by the way. Yeah, yeah. I said, who was the most talented martial artist you ever worked with? He said, Lawrence Alamis. I was like, really? I heard and that. I yes. more into him. I'm mm -hmm. like, ah, this guy is pretty damn legit and impressive. More, more so than I thought from just watching yeah. Renegade. You know, but to be fair, when um, the first thing when I met him, he said he just had knee surgery or something, mm -hmm. so he was wearing a knee brace, so uh, that 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 hindered him a little bit in our fight, you know. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but he still did all the kicks and everything. Yeah, for sure. Oh, here here's an interesting question: uh, Has Matthias ever been in a street fight? No, but I got knocked out in film. Oh, you did? What film? A fist fighter, really, a brutal knockout. Um, didn't see it coming, a full roundhouse, uh, not kick, you know, smack, uh, swing, like, you know, when you go bang and um, woke up on the floor. I thought, wow, this is how it feels like it. And it really hurt. And um, But you got to keep filming, you know, so... Didn't think much of it, really. Uh, never, ever anybody challenged me. Ever. I wouldn't think so. Six, five, mm -hmm. full of muscle. It's like, leave that dude alone. <laughs> yeah. You have a We're reputation, you know. <laughs> I've been all around the world in places you wouldn't want to know with real gangsters. They, they are being so kind to me, to be honest. You know. Mm. Yeah. yeah. Hey, what, what movie though did you like get knocked out on? A uh, fist fighter. Oh, fi fist fighter. Okay. Yeah. Also um, from uh, my ex girlfriend, she knocked me out. Did she? Uh, yeah. Yeah. After she I seen mean, that picture of you and that other actress, right? <laughs> in another incident, uh, before that, she had a bit of a violent temper. But what happened is, is this really interesting? Um, so she walks ahead of me, and suddenly figured out that something had happened with another girl. Or she thought so, and she turns and she gives me an uppercut. Um, she's five ten, you know, and she caught me here, uh, surprisingly. And there's a certain uh, trigger point; it dazzles you. I mean, it, it you know it, it weakens your legs. Yeah. So you go like this, and you think, "Oh my God, that was close." I was literally uh, struggling to keep my composure, and there was a girl. But I'm telling you, um, another incident. It's go I'm going down with my knockouts now from a film <laughs> to a girl, and this one's going to take the cake. Uh, so I'm in a restaurant with a fan, right? And he's a professional fan who wants to be a producer. He's a rich man. He wants to buy me a TV series, and he almost did. And um, spent a lot of money on that TV series. Long story short, he's in a restaurant, and there's this He's telling, this is Matthias, he's the biggest action guy, blah, 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 look at his muscles, blah, blah, blah. And I already see there's a, a, a four-year-old, five-year-old walking on the balustrade behind the tables, coming close to me. I didn't pay too much attention. And suddenly he's right there and he smacks me in the nose, full on, like wow. a child, like this. <laughs> Jeez. Because he was instigated through the talk, right? Mm. And uh, it hurt so much that I instantly had tears in my eyes. And I'm like, <laughs> oh, funny, blah, blah, blah. I have to go to the restroom real quick. I go to the restroom and go, oh, my God, this hurts. That, mind you, that was a five-year-old. Yeah, it doesn't matter, man. I mean, just getting hit smack in the nose. I mean, if my cat hit me in the nose like that, I'd probably kill it. My cat right yeah. here. Your shirt, dog right? can... I love the cat, by the way. Yeah, Your dog can hit you body. also with a paw. I have a great day, and, you know. Uh, it hurts, yeah. 
Oh, for sure. Uh, here's a question from Waldbeck. How was your experience working on Borrowed Time Falling Out? That would be with Alan Delabi, of course, right? Oh, yeah. Alan is such a... I love this guy. He's a go-getter. He's a Van Damme type. Uh, he's, he is, I mean, if he would have been around in the 80s, you know, it would have been easier. Um, he took himself so much time. We went to his dojo. He stretches me. He gives me all these tips, you know, because I just had knee surgery. Okay. And and he he became like my my uh, my sensei for that time okay. being there, you know. And I looked up to him. I admire him. He's so flexible. He's like you, you know. Yeah, and sure. uh, I always uh, want to learn from people that are really good because there's always something to learn. He taught my wife. My wife suddenly got really flexible. We filmed all of it, okay. all these little tricks and gadgets. I filmed it, and my wife religiously trains uh, after his tips, you know. And she she's now almost into the split. And uh, I I almost got I got pretty down, but then I pulled my hamstring, uh, had another knee surgery, so I'm starting again, you know. But he got us motivated. Yeah, for sure. Uh, one person actually asked a question earlier. Uh, what was like the worst injury you ever got filming some of your action scenes? Yeah, nothing. Only over the years, it's the abuse. You know, two knee, four knee, four knee surgeries, bone on bone. Yeah, just the wear and tear of basically working out. Yeah, all this stuff. Yeah. Your whole life. And again, if if I may, I don't tell. I don't have to tell you. But you can tell your uh, viewers this over and over. Stretch, you know. I was lazy. When I uh, did No Retreat, No Surrender, Roy Horan, he said to me, if you would just start training martial arts like a real martial artist and take yourself time to stretch, you could beat a lot of people out there. And I'm like, oh, yeah, whatever. I'm an actor. And, <laughs> I, yeah, no, and I regret it because mm -hmm. I muscled through... 30 years of action and muscle through it. And I'm watching you and I'm watching others. I'm watching along De La Vie. They don't muscle. You don't muscle. You are flexible. So mm -hmm. it's all in the patience, you know, not just looking like this, uh, stretch. As much as you work out, stretch. The same reps, actually, as you do in weights, you should do in stretching, right? Yeah, I, I start every workout with stretching because, yeah. you know, you, you're like a lifetime fitness guy, too. I always tell people, everybody just wants to look good, which is fine, but that's yeah. like the third thing. It's, it's it really is. second, feel good because you stretch, you do mobility stuff, yoga type things, and and then the looking good part is is the third most important thing. <laughs> you know, you got you yeah. to need your health and you need to feel good first, especially when you yes. get older. But and it's then, definitely a mixed up. I mean, you got it figured out. You have an amazing body. You got a six pack. You got it figured out. Um, it's a full time job. It is. It's a lifestyle. So yeah, yeah. definitely, definitely. It's a full time job. Here's a question, Evil Alex. What was your favorite set experience you had doing a film? Um, Age of Treason. That was a TV series that never got picked up. Um, because I got to play a gladiator in ancient Rome in, in the biggest Colosseum in the world with lions and uh, thousands of extras. And I felt like I was a gladiator. And I almost died there because they have all these shafts where they bring up the lions, you know, mm -hmm. and I'm fighting and one was open and something in the last moment told me and I looked around and it was an inch away up breaking my neck but that was um uh amazing to be a gladiator you know it's like uh you are um, with the lions down there they're in cages and everything and you're in a real coliseum and you're in this outfit and you're in uh on an elevator that really is being pulled up like that and then you come up there with your sword and then there's the, the, the caesar type people and the woman and they're all in the stadium and they're screaming at you and you you're fighting you you think this is real yeah sure yeah, yeah that must have been an amazing experience so at least you got to experience that because you you didn't get yeah. the gladiator movie but you did still be able to be the gladiator right yeah so that's, that's, uh, that's TV series, yeah. yeah that's cool uh here's one 
Uh, how was it like working on Black Belt with Don the Dragon Wilson? Yeah, interesting. Um, Don was the first professional fighter I worked with after kickboxer. Sometimes I mix this up almost. Felt like it was so much in the beginning, right? Very much in the beginning. And um, Don was instantly, uh, he had no movie star allures, you know? He was just a regular nice guy. And I was so impressed that he was so nice to me. He was the lead and the bad guy. I had all these muscles and he didn't mind me having muscles. A lot of times I noticed uh, people don't want me to take my shirt off or they don't like it, you know. He, he, You'll make he them look not... bad, that's why. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. I mean, a little bit maybe. And, and then um, he wasn't like that. He was so nice. And then fighting him, he wasn't about to hurt me. It was so easy. The guy was good. I admired him. I, I'm in awe of real champions, obviously, you know. Yeah, so, sure. yeah. I, re uh, I remember a story Don told me shooting the scene on Black Belt with you, and he got in an argument with the director because the director kept wanting him to get closer to your face when he was doing those multi roundhouse kicks. Oh, 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 yeah, oh, yeah. Just move the camera angle. I don't need yeah, to yeah. want to, you know, potentially, you know, accidentally kick him. Chuck Moore, yeah. Nice director, but maybe it, it wasn't his thing. You know, you don't have to hit someone. You know, the angle of the camera sells it. So Don wasn't about to do it. At no point he came even close. Way yeah. too professional. I did break Robert Morano's nose. So. Oh, you did. And I felt to that day, I've never, ever heard anybody ever in film except Robert. And he never liked me again. And I understand. <laughs> yeah. yeah, it's hard to like the guy that broke your nose. Um, yeah. <laughs> they yeah. there or not. But uh, here, here's, a, here's a question. Uh, if you could choose any actor, dead or alive, who would you love to work with? Well, obviously Van Damme. Mm -hmm. um, Mel Gibson. Mel Gibson. Okay. Mm. He, so intense, you know. It's my age. It's very intense. You know, I just worked with Gina Carano talking about that. That was really kind of looking forward to it, except we ended up not having enough action together, you know, or at all. This is a Chuck Liddell movie, the same one, right? Gina Carano's in that? No, no, that was a Western. Oh, you did that Western with her. Yeah. And that was kind of a letdown for me because it's Gina Carano and it's Matthias Hoos, right? Mm -hmm. So I... I begged the director or the producer, I said, come on, I'm Matthias Hughes. Let me be the bad guy, the one of the main bad guys, and let me have it out with her because yeah. this is this is where it's at. The audience is going to love this. And he said, the role is taken. I'm like, oh, no, what do you want from me? I want you to play the guy that comes in halfway through the movie that looks like he's going to rescue her, but it's not going to happen because you look like someone that could rescue her. So I ended up doing that just to be with Gina Carano, but I was obviously disappointed, not that I, you know, got the chance to fight her. And you go on IMDb, you know, the people that watch it, they got really nasty, you know, like, why would you hire materials if you don't use them? You know? mm, interesting. Yeah. Uh, here, here's here's one. Uh, what, this guy wants to know what it was like working with everybody. <laughs> what was it like working with Martin Cove in Deathmatch? Oh, yeah. So Martin Cove, that is a really interesting character, you know. Um, he's so colorful. He he used to be Hollywood's bad boy in the 70s. He was in Rambo. He was a martial artist. He was really thought after. He was on his way up, like mm -hmm. strong, you know. Yeah, sure. And something happened that derailed his career, and he ended up doing movies like I did, you know. Uh, martial art movies, um, playing the bad guy, and I'm ironically last committee. I'm playing Martin Cove in Deathmatch. Okay, <laughs> you know what I mean. It's yeah. like when I was uh, when I was doing Deathmatch, I was, I mean, jacked, big. That was my peaking, right? Mm -hmm. And I looked at Martin Cove as someone older. You know, like, oh, well, yeah, that is Martin Cole from Karate Kid Drama. And this is now he's playing the the talking head. So that, and that's me now, really. But um, 
everyone has their days, right? Yeah, yeah, for sure. For yeah. Sure. And but uh, I will okay. make sure to talk to Mike Muller and Ross to give me the enough screen time because in terms of fighting, um Billy Blanks, you know. Yeah, you you guys gotta I mean a you lot know, of people are gonna watch that movie for the fights, of course. Yeah, know. and uh, look, I'm 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 the bad guy. I'm really the root of all evil. Literally, very bad person. You, you hate me. Uh, the one that you hate is the one that needs to get his ass kicked. But it's not going to be easy. Yeah, there has to be that payoff, you know. And uh, Billy Blanks has a huge reason to hate me. The biggest reason from all people. Interesting. In the movie, yeah. Yeah. That's interesting. <laughs> so I'm assuming he'll beat you in the movie, hopefully, right? Hopefully. Well, of course. Well, yeah. I'm not going to say it. Of course not. I'm kidding. Uh, of course I don't not. Know. Yeah, no, this movie's a little different. The bad guy actually <laughs> wins. Um, here's a question. What was your experience and opinion about making the fight scene with both Sasha Mitchell and Vince Murdaco in Kickboxer 2? And how, how did you get that role? Uh, yeah, I just got it offered because I already had that reputation, you know? Okay. And then, yeah. And then um, Vince, amazing kid, good looking, friendly, a real kickboxer. He's really a good guy. He knows how to fight. So that was great to see. Uh, Sasha, like I said, him and me were shaky, but good enough, but shaky. Mm -hmm. But I'm a realist. So, but I thought he did an amazing job for coming on in that franchise. He was married to it. I was married to it. We were all married to it. And then obviously Michelle Kissy, Carrie Tagaba um, made this, in my opinion, a fairly good movie. Obviously, it's a sequel, but Dumb wasn't in it, but we gave it all. Yeah. Sure. Yeah, a lot of people really like that one. A lot of yeah, it had a good story. It. You know, it kind of continued, and it's always nice the dojo and the problems. And I liked it. I liked the story, and it had Peter Boyle in it, fantastic actor great locations there was a lot of extras we had a big arena right mm, yeah it was great great experience yeah here, here's a question you probably get asked this a lot how did matthias work out to get so muscular and still stay so athletic because a, a lot of guys are a little slower you move really quick despite your size yeah you got to train all the time mm, yeah train all the time so did yeah. you like lift heavy did you do like powerlifting back in the day to build your size or did you just naturally able to put on muscle easy no very heavy oh yeah okay so you did the uh, old i work out like a bodybuilder i'm not kidding i mean for so many years i never stop i i have no breaks i don't know what a break means oh yeah like we said it's a lifestyle so like what what's yeah. your workout routine these days usually well um always the same i go to the gym i say i'll go every day but it won't work out obviously because there's always something so i make it four or five times a week minimum um i always uh, do cardio first then i do chest and biceps or back and no chest and triceps back and biceps legs uh shoulders and legs at one point and always uh stretching in the end mm, nice yeah. yeah, and I just rented a room in the gym in the back. Uh, I ordered mats and punching bags. So I'm going to uh, start kicking there again, you know, oh, with cool. my wife. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. She's got the flexibility for Mel and Delavi. That's great. Yeah, she she really, like, she has a black belt so in karate. And uh, she's cool. She has a real black belt, so. We, I've, okay, we so together. Maybe that's where I got confused and said you had the black belt. It was actually your wife who's got the black belt. <laughs> she has a black belt. <laughs> yeah, that is, that's a mistake on their part. Um, hey, so I know you've worked with Alexander Nevsky quite a bit, and I, I've interviewed mm -hmm. him, and you guys yeah, I saw that. Together. Nice interview, yeah. Yeah, so how, how do you like uh, working with him? Well, Alexander is um, a bodybuilder like me. Uh, used to be a boxer. Yeah. We have a kinship. Um, we met each other 11 years ago and he invited me to Russia and he invited me to all the big gyms and I gave seminars and uh, we, we did a lot of, we did a lot for sport. We, we toured around Russia promoting fitness and bodybuilding in schools and 
Yeah, we went to orphanages together. So we became friends and uh, we loved working out together with Ralph Miller, Ralph, Arnold, myself, him, at Golds. Um, I, I mean, I don't live in LA at the moment, so it's mostly him, Ralph, and Arnold, but you know, uh, that used to be our thing. Arnold wasn't there all the time. It's mostly Ralph and um, Ralph Miller. You know him? He's I like know of him. I know Mr. Him. Mr. Yeah. Universe. Yeah. He was in the too. Gladiator. So him yeah. and Alex, we really hang out together and smoke cigars, you know, in Beverly Hills. Cool. Good guy. Yeah, he's he's a nice guy. I like him. I actually got his uh, gunfight. At Rio Bravo, Rio Bravo yeah. Director Joe Cornett signed that for me, which is pretty cool. Yeah, Joe is a cool guy too. So uh, we just did a sequel of that with uh, Don Wilson, Cynthia Rothrock. It's funny, another cowboy movie. Uh, <laughs> that seems to be the popular films these days, right? She's doing another one too. Yeah, I know. I know. So that was fun. Um, expect more action in that. Yeah, for sure. Uh, we'll just leave here with a comment and one last question. So Alan Andalon says, Matthias Hughes is a badass, which I think we can all agree with. <laughs> Thank and you. And Alex, one last question. What was your favorite film as a kid? Uh, as a kid. Uh, so literally, I loved Arnold's movies, you know. Um, Predator. Oh, no, Predator wasn't a kid anymore. <laughs> <laughs> uh, as a kid, listen to this. Yeah, I, I have a great story. This is this is like, thank you God that I even experiences this. Literally, I uh, my favorite actor was Ryan O'Neill. You won't know him. He was the Brad Pitt of the seventies, right? He was married to Farrah Fawcett, and he did a boxing movie with uh, I think Barbara Streisand was in it. He was playing a boxer, and I was so enamored with him. And I, I said, I want to be like him one day, but he's so good looking. It, got, it doesn't matter. I want to be like him one day. He's a fighter. And then he did this movie, Driver, and he was this cool guy, you know. And I said, oh, I want to be like him. And then um, he did Love Story. That was like the biggest thing when I grew up as a child. Um, he was the Brad Pitt. He, he got an Oscar, all that stuff. And he lifted up. And that was my childhood hero. And I was this pimply, uh, plain guy. Uh, my hair was brown and I was skinny. They teased me always at the track and field. They called me the chicken man because I had a, no chest, you know. And they said, you need to work out and blah, blah, blah. And I was always made fun of, my big nose. And then he was the guy I went to the movies and I closed my eyes. I came out of the movies and I thought, I felt like him all day long and I didn't want to look in the mirror because I didn't want to break that illusion that I was uh, Ryan O'Neill, right? And um, as soon as I looked in the mirror, my, my world was shattered. I was this ugly guy, tall, awkward, never got a girl. My best friend got all the girls. I was like, ah, my life's horrible. So, and I thought, I gotta get out of this. I, I, I gotta do something. I don't want to end up like this. I didn't think about movies yet. So I went to the gym. I worked out. My hair got blonde for some reason because I always went to <laughs> South of France and stuff. Um, I let it grow. Anyway, long story short, I go to Hollywood. I work out in the gym. It's a gym in Brentwood where only movie stars work out, right? And it belongs to Ryan O'Neill. Okay. Uh, if I tell you it works out there, you wouldn't believe it. Ben Affleck, uh, Brad Pitt at one time, Angelina Jolie, wow. Jessica uh, Biel, um, uh, Jerry Brookheimer, all the big producers, everybody, all the girls that are famous mm -hmm. work out there. I work out there too. So I go there, I work out, and this guy comes up to me and he says, I just want to let you know, my name is uh, Brian or something. Shook my hand. I love your movies. I love what you do. And I'm like, oh, thank you, Brian. Thank you. Didn't think anything of it. I keep working out. And I'm looking in the mirror and I think, wait, that's Ryan O'Neill. Who just came up to me? Wow. Oh, that's incredible. Yeah. Wow. That guy I was hoping to be, but never obviously had a shot at it, came to me and says, I love your movies. And I went back. I hugged him. I said, thank you. You don't know. And we became friends, you know. Yeah, that, that's great. That must have made 
well, obviously more than just your day, but uh, yeah. imagine this, you, this ugly child. I never forget the day when I told my parents, I'm going to go to Hollywood. They say, are you crazy? What makes you think you can? And, and so there's the will, there's a way. Yeah, but I think in general, people would obviously consider you a really good looking guy, which is why you <laughs> said the club used to pay you with your leather pants and your muscle shirt, probably just for eye candy for the women. Right? Yeah, but that was only because I, I knew, I learned from a young age so there's got to be something you have to accessorize yourself with. So it was the muscles, the longish hair, there was better hair back then, and, and an outfit. So you represent something that no one dares to do. Mm. And in Hollywood, that attracts people. Do you know what I mean? Because you're so yeah. out there, like you become different. like a mascot or something. And um, that's how I worked in all those clubs, Voila, 2020, uh chippendales i became an exotic dancer also but you know it, it just helped me to get more confidence you know yeah one, one last thing and i i've heard you tell this story before um didn't sylvester sloan you think he thought you were like a gigolo or something <laughs> can yeah. you share that sloan story? <laughs> yeah, yeah, so crazy. these stories are always so embarrassing but um <laughs> i went to this i have rich friends you know uh, um, as an actor you always have wealthy friends so to speak they are so rich and you're so poor and uh, they throw these high end uh, charity parties and they invited Whitney Houston to sing it's like a private thing right wow, yeah. and then I'm there and then they place me into a table with these older women and I was dressed like Fabio back then we were all dressed like Fabio I had a dinner jacket but no shirt and then <laughs> People always called me Fabio for some reason, you know, and I got always mad at it. And I'm like, I'm not Fabio. Um, so I'm sitting next to Stallone's wife, uh, mother, sorry, mother. And then next thing you know, this other older woman, she's a high ranking industry maker and shaker. And I, I kind of was like suggesting being, you know, be friendly, you know, it's going to help you. <laughs> And uh, I'm like, okay. Anyway, so Sylvester Stallone walks in, and I'm like, oh, instantly my heart goes boop, 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 boop. He's the biggest movie star in the world besides Arnold. And I was still green, and for me to see him, and he's like, hi, hi, hi. And he sees me, and it's like he looks at a peasant or like a disease or leprosy, you know? And he makes a huge, it's like, <laughs> and I'm like, oh my God. I'm never going to work with him, you know. And then um, that was embarrassing, you know. Yeah. Like, he was, he was hmm? you or something or had the wrong impression of you and, you know, standing next to his, his mom. <laughs> yeah. But, you know, years later, uh, his wife, ex-wife, and I, we became an item, Bridget Nielsen, you know. Oh, you actually dated her? Yeah, yeah. We were together. Uh, funny story. In in the early years, not not always. In the early years, I, I sort of had a bit of a reputation that I like women a lot, and um, so the producers would call me and says, "Listen, I uh, I got this really beautiful girl, and I was wondering if you could work for a little less. You know, she's from Baywatch or this girl, blah blah blah, trying to get me in the movies. You know, and then I get this call from this producer, and he says, you know." I have only so much to pay you, but the co-star, she's really famous. She's one of the famous women in the world, you know, at that time. You should really think about uh, working for this money and points, you know? Hmm. Uh, and I said, who is it? And he said, Bridget Nielsen. I'm like, oh, okay. All right, I'll do the movie. And then um, I thought to myself, I'm not going to, okay, this is crazy. I'm not going to end up with Bridget Nielsen because he said it, you know, it's like, no way. I don't need that reputation. I'm not like that. You know, even though I said I'm doing, I'm not, it's never going to no. And I, from the beginning was trying not to end up with her, you know, but as it is on a film, the moment she walks in, I'm in the ring, I'm fighting. I take one look at her and she takes one look at me and I thought, Oh, that's going to be it. 
and it was it, you know. And it was so much fun because we both were young and crazy and uh we were out there. I mean, we were gone. We were like in the limo, into the nightlife. We had nightclubs when they closed, uh, the major nightclubs. They left us alone with a DJ to dance all night. And we drove in. Like Stallone had this car, this this uh, Koenig Mercedes, the big tires and everything. And she found out that I like it. So she got me that car, you know. Uh, she called Stallone. And it was in some garage. So next day I have it. <laughs> and we're driving around town crazy in the middle of the night, you know, and it had police sirens on it. And I mean, we were just kids in the candy store. We were just living it up to the yeah. max. Wow. Um, that was a wild, crazy, crazy time. So wild that the producer is like, ah, if you don't stop it, you'll never work in Hollywood again. You both are the worst. Because we ended up in some mansion in the middle of the night and we overslept, right? And that's bad. That, that I, it never happens to me. I'm German, so I don't come to late. But in this case, we overslept. And he called and he said, are you with Bridget? And I'm like, oh, shit. Yeah. Oh, my God. And he was so angry. So I told Bridget, okay, uh, I'm going to smuggle you to the set. And she had to lay on the floor of my car because <laughs> I... It's so crazy. Anyway, he was already waiting three blocks away with a phone. And, oh, you'll never work in town again. I'll make sure both of you are. But he was just so angry. And we really did a good job in this movie. So we worked again together anyway. Yeah, it worked uh, out. That's, that's great. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. So she she was with all the, the big shots back then. Arnold, Stallone. Oh, she told you, me stories. You know? Oh, my God. I can't repeat them. They are so amazing. I'm sure. I'm sure. That they girl. Are. That woman, amazing woman, had the insight. So, mm. hey, uh, a couple people keep bringing this up. Uh, what is the Matthias story about the CIA and Hollywood? Yeah, that's that's so interesting. Um, I have nothing to do with the CIA. However, I'm shooting a movie in um, uh, Alabama. Sorry, Watership Warrior. And I get a phone call. One of those guys, the father of a famous actor, I don't want to mention his name, knew we shooting a movie. And he said, do you guys want to do a movie in the Philippines? Hmm. All you have to do, it's not a real movie, but you have to go in, pretend, and you have to get some sensitive material out of there, uh, basically as a production. And then we were kind of told, is a CIA operation or something, right? Sounds like <laughs> yeah. the plot of a movie. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And I'm like, I'm in. <laughs> I'm in. Uh, I, I'm in. That's it. I'm in. Uh, my best friend said, I'm in. We were all in. But it didn't happen. And I thought, this is crazy. This is so crazy. This could have been a really great adventure or the end of the road. I don't know. <laughs> yeah. uh, you've seen Argo, right? Um, Argo, the CIA produced Argo. So there's a lot of times the they have an agency that just that sits in Hollywood but nobody knows where that actually produces movies and does these kind of operations, right? And I was thinking this is insane because I can go to any country in this world ever. I've been I've been to uh, Egypt for instance, right? And I was there uh, when I went to Egypt I had the Minister of Culture, I had uh, army guards with me. The pyramids were closed at that time. They're opening the pyramids just for me. Wow. You know, ah, I can do anything I want. I was with the princess. And I mean, I was like, wait a minute. If I would be a spy, nobody would ever know. All I have to do is bring a movie into any country, right? So I was thinking, that's fucking crazy. So I wrote the, a letter to the CIA, you know, offering my services. And then <laughs> I'm not kidding, but because I like adventure. And then um, I can only tell you this because nothing happened. I never got an answer. <laughs> okay, okay. And I'm like, years later, I was like, thank God, what was I thinking, right? Yeah. So I, I wrote a script, a television series that I pitched at Sundance about uh, an actor who ends up working for the CA in Hollywood. It's kind of like the cleaner, you know, like uh, uh, that 
that famous TV series where he cleans everything, the problems in Hollywood. Uh, anyway, long story short, it stimulated me to write a TV series about it, you know. About that's, it. that's Jean-Claude Van Johnson from Amazon Prime. That's that so, show. I didn't know. There's something. No, similar. I mean, maybe someone stole your idea. No, not on this one. Uh, another movie they did, not this one, uh, because mine was a bit different. There's a down and out, or maybe it is the same. There's a down and out actor that uh, only had one television series, right? And he's uh, forgotten, and he teaches martial arts now in Venice. And there's this one guy that is actually working for the CIA, recruiting all these actors and gives credits for movies and this and that. But he is not a tough guy, so he hires the actor to pretend he's the CIA guy to do the dirty work for him because he doesn't want to do it. And that's that actor gets so into it that he actually becomes one of the most powerful people in Hollywood abusing the CIA card. Hmm. Um, yeah, that kind. So the Van Damme was similar, or? Well, he was kind of like doing these missions because he was, you know, obviously John Claude Van Damme, an actor, but he would go to these different oh. countries, oh, film, see. film the movie there, but really do an undercover operation as as Van Johnson, like a CIA operative. So uh, it sounded like the same exact plot of what you almost got involved with in real life and then wanted to do. You know? Right. So it's not so far fetched then, right? No, it's not so far fetched. Mm. I wouldn't be surprised if that actually happens. So I have a theory on Steven Seagal now. You know how Steven Seagal would kind of um, imply that he might have had ties to the CIA, though he wouldn't downright right. say he right. did. Maybe you never know. He, well, maybe he created that story when he was first doing movies. Kind of created the mythos of maybe he's connected to the CIA, but maybe he said that because nobody later would ever think he was still connected to the CIA once he got into movies. So right. that's why he said that, and then like he's really doing CIA stuff as he's shooting his movies. Uh, that's a very good possibility because when you are involved in certain things you don't want people to know, you say it that you were and make it kind of like, you know, like you you know what I mean. Oh you, yeah, you, yeah. Nobody would. It, think it's so ridiculous. He said he was before the movies. Right. So. so like you go on a date and the girl asks you, "What do you do for a living?" You say you're a hitman. She's not going to believe that. <laughs> exactly. Oh, this guy's funny. He's just joking, right? <laughs> <laughs> Maybe not so much. But uh, anyway, anyway, thanks, Matthias. This was such oh. a um, a great discussion here. I know. I know you probably you had an appointment. I thought that Sean told me so. We would have been limited on time, but we we really talked for a long time, and I appreciate. Yeah, but the, the appointment is just my mom because I. I oh, that I, was uh, the one that Sean was talking about. Okay. Yeah. Okay. yeah. Um, it's all good. It's fantastic. I can obviously we have so much in common, and I I love the community you built. I read the comments. I read. Uh, I look at your videos. I enjoy it. So know that actors do enjoy it. I mean, I listen to it and. Uh, it's it's cool. It's like uh, when we actors are together, there's a lot of free time in terms of the next setup. Okay. We're sitting in the trailer, and guess what we do? It's like this. <laughs> yeah. It's all we talk about is, hey, you work with so-and-so. How was that? And then there's these anecdotes. They go on forever. I mean, it's like, oh, my God. You're like, this is crazy. I had no idea. <laughs> yeah, it's crazy. And then just, you know interviewing you and then interviewing Muhammad Kisi, they literally need to make movies about you guys. Like your, your life is so interesting coming to Hollywood and all the craziness going on. I mean, that's, that's a movie good. in itself, a great movie should be. Yeah. I have a producer who wants to do something that was written in my book because I was taken hostage by the mob in Spain and uh, <laughs> by the with one of with big Hollywood producers in my toe. Uh, it's in my book, Shortness in Hollywood. Great story, real story, just one of many. Um, not bragging, it's just insane. When you're an actor, you get yourself in situations because you end up in some country, no matter where, and the people know you, and they they come to you, and it's not always the good people. You don't know, or it's mm -hmm. the, the, the present. Oh, I got one more story. You want to hear a really cool one? Oh, yeah, please. <laughs> I only tell this to you because you know how to appreciate it. Uh, <laughs> Menachem Golan. That's all I say. Menachem Golan, the one that produced Bloodsport, right? Mm -hmm. Canon, yeah. So obviously, I know that Menachem Golan can make a career. And I'm dying to get a 
a movie for him, with him as a lead, right? So Van Damme did it, everybody else, I'm spawned. I'm like, I'm going to get a deal. I'm the next one, you know? I finally, finally get an appointment with him himself, the king of these films. And it's in, in the Canon office, a oh. big office, a huge building. So I go in, it's like in the movies. I go in and there's this desk, but no furniture in this giant room, just a desk, right? Mm -hmm. And I'm like, that's freaky. There was a, a chair, so I sit down, we talk. He was very nice, he was open, he was receptive. Next thing you know, I'm not lying, People come in and take the desk out. Hmm, okay. And it was the end of canon. I, <laughs> oh, okay. So, like, bad timing. If you would have gotten a, a movie deal, all those movies would have fell through because they lost their. Yeah, he done. saw me for no reason. Wow. <laughs> so, maybe he, saw, maybe he but, thought you could save him. We get one more hit. I, don't, this, this I guy. have no idea. I have no idea why I was there. But the story has a really strange ending. Okay. And that's how life is. Okay. So add almost 30 years to that, right? Minimum 27 years or something. I'm in Uzbekistan and uh, I'm presenting an award and I'm at a guest of the, the leader of Uzbekistan. There is a woman. She's the, 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 the daughter of the president. She's like the queen, mm. power, most powerful person in that country, right? So I'm there, Menachem Golan is there, Jared Depatieu, so many, Mickey Rock. There were so many people were there by now, right? All big people. And so I'm one of the celebrities. But we're talking about the princess. It's like in a, in a fairy tale. It's like in another world. You can't just go to the princess. You know, first time I wanted to say hi to her, I said, oh, don't even look at her. They'll kill you, you know. Over the time while I was there, the week, I, I did master classes at the university and she started to like me. And I thought, man, this is crazy. I'm going to do a movie in Uzbekistan. And I start writing a, a, a screenplay out, outline for like a Born Identity Time action movie. And um, I'm meeting with the bank and the, the bank is like, money is no object. Uh, we want Hollywood here. We're going to give you as much money as you want, but you're going to have to ask the princess. If she oh. says yes, it's it's yours. It's, sky's the limit. I said, I need the military. I need the, uh, no problem. So I come back the next year. I have the script. And I in the last press conference, and Menachem and I were in the uh, first row, and I knew... I only have a few seconds to storm. It's like uh, to storm the podium where she was holding a speech. Mm -hmm. And it's like the White House, you know, they have the CIA, the security people and all this. Good luck getting to her. So I said, I'm going to do it. I get up and the moment I get up, I see Menachem Golan getting up too. Also with a script, <laughs> right? And I'm like, oh, the fuck. It's like, who gets there first? It's going to get her ear. <laughs> yeah, <sure. laughs> and I'm racing against Menachem Golan, but he beat me. He beat me and uh, she's like talking to Menachem and he's the script and talking to her and talking to her and she's like, I could see it in her eyes. She, she was a bit unnerved, you know, she was, it was too much. She's too much of a salesperson. Anyway, she finally gets rid of him and I'm like, ah, oh, Menachem, here you go. You know, I was so pissed. Uh, I thought you over here, you know, you're done. Um, but then again, I was like, he's the godfather. I want to kiss his feet at the same time. It's kind of <laughs> weird, right? But I wanted to survive my project. So I put her my project. I gave her my project. And she's like, oh, this is nice. Let me read it. I'll give it to the secret police and secret this and secret that. Um, let's see. If it's good for our country, I'll do it. No, don't worry. And then um, I flew back to Bali. And then they finally call. I fly back there. And I have a meeting with the Secret Service, whatever the secret CIA people, like in the movies, you know. Yeah. And and they say, no, this makes us look bad, you know, this movie, because it's uh you make us look bad. We can't do it. So all this was for nothing. 
And then I had a tropical disease. I almost died and I went to the hospital and they, and they did surgery there, but I had uh, no money on me because my credit card didn't work. And I end up in a, in a hospital that's like in a, a third world, a second world war, like underground with blood everywhere. People were smoking. The surgeon was smoking while he was working. On <laughs> and, and I thought my leg's going to fall off. And I call someone and says, you got to call the princess, you know. And uh, I'm dying in her country. Yeah. It's not a good picture. I'm from Hollywood. Don't forget. <laughs> so uh, they actually transport me into the president's uh, hospital that's built for the president in the president's. Oh, so you get the good hospital. hospital. <laughs> <laughs> and it's everyday surgery, blah blah blah, and they healed me, blah blah blah. And then they said, "Do you want any more surgeries? You can have anything you want." Right. <laughs> so that was my Uzbekistan story with Menachem Golan. That's hilarious. So basically, you went over there to pitch a movie competing against Menachem, and then you almost died, but then you got brought back to life in the good hospital. Right. right. Uh, but so it was so funny because, you know, the two times I saw Menachem Golan, it was a, 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 nothing came out of it. Um, I had lunch with him and everything down there. He's the godfather of movies, you know. Um, oh, no doubt. No doubt. Mm -hmm. And, mm -hmm. uh, you know, I know his nephew, Gabriel, by the way. Mm -hmm. and, um, I'll tell you more about that later. I'll tell you more about okay. that later. But it's just so funny that you're pitching movie scripts to literal princesses. I mean, yeah, the script funny. that I wrote, I, I've pitched it all over to in, in the, to people, investors in the UK, Hawaii, Australia, etc. But I've, I've, I haven't got a meeting. I haven't been able to... Um, you know, pitch it to a princess or anybody. <laughs> well, that's only because I, I got lucky enough to be invited. It's yeah, it's, it's, it's very difficult. It's uh, almost impossible to pull this off. To produce, to get your script produced and to, to produce a movie, it's so hard because it's so much money involved, you know? Yeah, yeah, so much. And, and I mean, that's... Uh, mm -hmm. on on a closing note uh that's yeah. why you guys need to click the link for the kickstarter for the last kuma day to try to help that there's 10 days left it's getting close but there's oh, still an yeah. uphill battle needs about sixty thousand left for that kickstarter so hopefully that money rolls in in the next week and a half i totally appreciate you pushing it and sean does as well and thank you and um We'll do a, we'll kick ass. I mean, I, I'm proud of Sean. I'm proud of everybody involved. Uh, like I said, it's going to be a project of love and labor. Mm -hmm. And uh, I'm, I'm, I'm amazed everybody's on board. They all said yes. You know, some I wish would have said yes, but they didn't. I would have, uh, I think Richard Norton doesn't have time. Don Wilson was actually sick at that I time. When, yeah. yeah. So some unfortunate mishaps have happened. Mm -hmm. But you can't have everybody. You you got more than enough. I mean, that would have been really mm -hmm. cool had that finally been the film that you and Van Dam worked on. That would yeah. have been cool, you know. That would have been cool. But it's movies, but. look. I mean, to get Van Dam, he's done it already. Why would you want to do it? Yeah, he, he's already done it. Unless there was like yeah. a true sequel to Bloodsport, maybe. But, yeah, done done by Paramount or something. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. A ten million dollar movie or something for sure, man. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah, again, thanks so much, Matthias. This was great, and the audience Thank really had you. a blast. I totally there. enjoyed it. You're a cool guy. You're the real deal. It's it's a pleasure to talk to someone that's out there. <laughs> thanks, thanks. And, and hang on yeah. a second. I, I do want to uh, tell you something. After okay. It's uh, live.